The story takes place in a deserted area. Inside an abandoned building, some people are being held as prisoners. One of them apologizes, admitting that everything has turned out like this because of him. The professor rebukes him, asserting that it is his fault that Kang and his soldiers are in this mess. Major Kane understands that their mission would have succeeded if only their informant hadn't betrayed them. The enemies are highly trained soldiers with three times the manpower their intelligence had projected. They know their plans from the outset, ambushing them and turning the whole operation into a trap they unwittingly walked into. Suddenly, the door opens and they throw another person inside. Kang recognizes him as Sergeant Kim, who is badly injured. Kim curses the person who brought him here and in a cold tone says something in a different language that Kane doesn't understand. Kim gets struck with a gun as the man leaves, smiling. Kane coughs and curses, feeling toyed with. Kim asks if Kane is alright, and he replies that he is fine, then inquires about the other soldiers. Kim responds that he doesn't know, they were all taken elsewhere. The door opens again, and they turn to see the same person standing there who had entered before. The man collapses, revealing another figure behind him who asks if he is Major Hanshin Kang. Kang, surprised to hear him speak Korean, questions who he is. The man explains that he has come for him and instructs them to follow. As they proceed down the passage, Kang notices the bodies of enemy soldiers and questions the man about his division and how many troops have been deployed. The man replies that he cannot disclose who he works for and that he has come alone. Kang is astonished that he managed to take them down alone without detection. A door opens, and an enemy soldier spots them fleeing. He readies his gun as another one appears, blocking their path. The man who saved them swiftly attacks, throwing a knife and killing one of them instantly. Kang is shocked at how effortlessly he neutralizes them without using a gun. The masked man urges them to move quickly, promising to handle the hostile enemies, and reminds Kang not to use his rifle unless absolutely necessary, in other words, to stay out of his way. He neutralizes the enemies ahead with his suppressed pistol, allowing them to advance. Facing multiple enemies, Kang considers assisting, but the man charges in boldly without hesitation. He slides, swiftly shoots them, and reloads his gun before moving forward. Kang is amazed by his skills, realizing his tactics are far too reckless for a standard military soldier. When they finally reach safety, the man instructs them to wait. Kang, confused, notices his subordinates struggling to keep up. He realizes he failed to consider their weakened state and understands that, regardless of the situation, he should have kept them in check, showing that the masked man has anticipated all of this. The man has black eyes and speaks Korean fluently. Kang asks if he is Korean, but the man ignores him, urging them to move. They traverse a field to find Kang's soldiers waiting. Kang questions how they all arrived, and they explain that the masked man freed them. The man states that he will remain behind and directs them to head southwest, where someone will be waiting for them. Kang thanks him, but the man dismisses it, saying he is just completing his mission. Kang realizes the man is a mercenary. Despite this, Kang extends his hand, insisting on expressing his gratitude. The man looks at his hand and suddenly, a strange sound startles them. He shouts for them to get down as an explosion occurs. Kang wonders if it was a mortar. His hearing is impaired but he sees his soldiers unharmed. Gunfire erupts, and Kang notices the masked man still fighting, holding back the enemies. To his shock, he realizes the man is just a kid. The scene shifts to six months later at a school. The teacher introduces a new student to the class. The student introduces himself as Ai Jin Yu, revealing himself as the protagonist of this story. In another classroom, a girl is writing in her notebook. She thinks that her brother might be in homeroom class by now. Another girl enters and tells her friend that she saw a handsome guy who has just transferred and is a third-year student. The earlier girl wonders if perhaps the girl saw his brother. She had believed that her brother, along with her parents, died in a plane crash and never imagined he would return after ten years. She recalls that at the airport she was stunned to see her brother. Her grandpa sees him and starts crying, overjoyed that he is still alive. She wonders if it is truly her brother, and he looks at her, smiles, and says that she must be Dayan. Her thoughts are interrupted as a girl wakes her up, cursing because she had to shout her name many times. Dayun apologizes, and the girl orders her to bring her gym uniform, questioning if Dayun brought it. Dayun asks what she would wear if she gave it to her. The girl curses her, smacks her, and tells her not to talk back, saying it's her problem. She warns Dayun that she has been too nice to her, and it's time to teach her a lesson in front of the class. Dayun remains silent and does not resist. 
In Ejin's class, after the introduction, the teacher explains that he has been living abroad and hopes that they will help him adapt. The teacher tells him to take a seat in the back. A student wonders what is so special about him, thinking he looks like a loser. His name is Jae Hyung, and another guy tells him to do something. As Ejin passes by, Jae Hyung extends his leg to trip him, but he stops and glances at him. He is caught, and Jae Hyung arrogantly asks what he is looking at, unable to believe that Ejin is examining him. He curses Lee Jin and asks if he has a problem. Suddenly, the scene shifts to the past where Kane tells him that when he returns to Korea, he needs to stay away from fights. Lee Jin assures him that he knows and explains that he wouldn't engage in fighting without enough information about his surroundings because a mistake could cost him his life. He reminds the major that he has spent many years on the battlefield and is an expert. Kang explains that he is not saying it for Lee Jin's sake, but for the sake of the kid who might end up going against him. Jae Young threatens Lee Jin, and the teacher asks if there is a problem. Lee Jin apologizes to the teacher and goes to his seat. Jae Young laughs, calling him a loser. The teacher asks a student named Young Chan to help Lee Jin get ready for his first class. The student introduces himself as Young Chan Park. He whispers to Lee Jin, hoping he is not nervous about what just happened. He tells him about the guy who tried to trip him and explains that there are two guys in the class he should be worried about: Jae Hyung Lee and Hyo Chin Ju. He tells him their first class is math. Lee Jin thanks him for his help, and Young Chin tells him that he can ask anything he wants. The teacher enters the class and starts teaching. While studying, Lee Jin remembers his time on the battlefield amid gunshots and fighting. He feels peaceful here. A few hours later, school ends, and Dae In steps outside to find Lee Jin waiting for her. Startled, she asks if he has been waiting for her. He responds that he wanted to walk home with her, provided she had no other plans. She assures him that she doesn't, prompting him to smile and say, "Let's go." While walking, both of them are silent. Ejin questions if it's awkward, and she tries to explain it. He tells her that she shouldn't feel bad about it because it's weird for him too, as he suddenly appeared again out of nowhere. He was nine at the time of the accident, so he doesn't remember much about them, and it must have been weird for her too. They pass by a shop and see her class bully's friend with some boys. The girl notices Dayeon, prompting her to be scared of the consequences. The boy asks who she is, and the girl tells him that Dayeon is the girl who Jin hates. She questions if she is walking home with her boyfriend and makes fun of her. Dayeon explains that he is her brother. Ejin asks Dayeon if she considers her a friend, to which she replies that she is her classmate. Bitter, the girl insults Dayeon, insisting that she is not her friend. Meanwhile, Ejin continues to stare at them intently, which irritates one of the guys. Annoyed, he demands to know why Ejin is staring and warns him to be careful or risk getting hurt. Another guy, equally frustrated, also takes issue with Ejin's unwavering gaze. The heavier guy starts hurling insults at Ejin as he approaches, mocking him. However, Ejin can read all his movements and weaknesses, noting that he doesn't even have a weapon. He questions why the guy is leaving himself wide open. He suddenly remembers what Major Kang said to him and thinks of walking away. But before he can, the fat guy grabs him by the shirt and tells him to answer. Dayeon bows and apologizes for his brother's mistake, revealing that he just came from another country and doesn't know how things work here. As she trembles in fear, the plump dude dismisses her concerns and insists it's none of his business. Ejin locks eyes with Dayeon, and a surge of protected instinct washes over him. Without hesitation, he forcefully removes the man's grip, making him yelp in pain. Tossing his bag aside, Ejin sheds his blazer and shields Dayeon, urging her to stay put. The fat man hurls vulgar insults and swings a punch, but Ejin swiftly retaliates, sending him crashing to the ground. The bystander is dumbfounded, and Ejin realizes he's just betrayed Major Kang's trust. He shoots a gaze at the onlooker. At the military academy, soldiers are training while Kang observes them. Kim approaches and asks if today is Agent's first day at school. Kang replies that they trained him for six months, but he can't help but worry. Kim pities E Jin for enduring tough times since age nine and hopes he settles now that he's back home. Kang assures that the specialized lessons have equipped E Jin nicely, leaving him feeling content. Unbeknownst to them, their hopes are dashed. E Jin punches a guy and knocks him down. The other guy can't believe his friend fainted after a single hit, and both of them tremble. Ejin quickly moves into position and punches the other guy in the stomach, sending him flying and hurling down. The girl is shocked, and Ejin glances back, giving her a death stare. Dayeon is stunned by what happened, 
realizing that Ajin had only covered her eyes for a moment. He looks at Dayan and inquires if she was spooked. Then he offers to grab some snacks from the store, but she politely declines. Suggesting they head back, Dayan hands him his jacket, to which he responds with gratitude. The bully girl is left scratching her head, wondering how this dude went from giving her the stink eye to being all polite and grateful. Dayan says goodbye to the girl, and Ejin stares at her one last time. While walking, Dayan asks if he did that to those guys, and he tells her the truth. It's strange for her because he doesn't look like a guy who picks fights. She explains that it is rude to stare at people in Korea, and he can get into trouble. He reveals that it's the same in the country he came from, and depending on the person, it can be dangerous. Dayan questions why he gazed at them then. He answers her that he did it because they were causing her concern. After hearing this, her heart melts, and she stops talking. At home, their grandpa tells Aijin that he can clean the dishes so he can rest, but Aijin expresses willingness to do it himself and tells him to relax. His grandpa hoped he liked the dinner because he doesn't know how to cook very well. Aijin says he has been eating well and that every meal his grandpa makes is delicious. Dayan thinks to herself that grandpa is happy because Aijin likes his cooking, and he even took classes for him. Grandpa inquires about Dayan's thoughts on the dinner, to which she responds positively. He then turns to Aijin and inquires about his school day, with Aijin casually glancing at Dayan before echoing her sentiment. Grandpa is pleased that Aijin had a good day and bids them a good night before they sleep. In his cozy little nook, Aijin reminisces about his grandpa's words upon first meeting him and the delicious dishes he whips up. As sleep beckons, he drifts off into a dreamscape of a harrowing plane crash, jolting awake with a racing heart. His clock is ticking, and there is some noise coming from the kitchen. He goes out and sees Dayeon handling a pot. She tells him that she was about to wake him up. He inquires about Grandpa, and she informs him that he left for work. He is surprised, and she explains that Grandpa took some time off to stay home with him, and today is his first day back at work. Mentioning that she has to go now because she needs to get to school early and tells him to eat breakfast before leaving. He thanks her and looks at the food. At school in Dayeon's class, the girl from yesterday tells Huijin about the incident and asks if the new student was her brother. She replies that she is right. Yesterday, after Yijin left, she looked at them and was shocked at how he could knock both of them down with a single punch. Then Huijin appeared and asked her what was going on. The girl wonders if they should stop bullying Dayan because the look in his eyes alone scared her, but they brush it off, thinking everything should be fine because Huijin's brother and his men run the school. Huijin approaches Dayan and smacks her, telling her not to overreact. Dayan inquires about her desires, and Huijin instructs her to tag along. Despite her reluctance, Huijin asserts that not even the appearance of her brother will alter the situation, commanding her to hush and comply if she wishes to avoid a potential beating. Reaching a secluded spot, Huijin kicks Dayan and asks if she didn't tell her to keep her head down. Huijin then goes on to mock her brother for thinking he's tough, which is why she's acting all tough now. She reveals to Dayeon that her brother is about to face a rough welcome at JHS High School because of his interaction with guys who happen to be his brother's friends. Dayeon is left bewildered and demands to know what Hujin's game plan is. Hujin shuts her up with a slap and tells her to stop blabbering. Tears stream down Dayeon's face as she gets up and bolts away. In Ejin's class, a large crowd has gathered, and the guy from yesterday enters the class and approaches Ejin, who is minding his own business. Suddenly, Dayan appears, panting and yelling Ejin's name. He is shocked to see her. He looks at her and notices she is beaten up. Huijin's brother asks if she is here because she cares about her brother, unlike her sister who only whines. Huijin appears and tells him to shut up. She'll only start fretting when he actually gets a proper beatdown. A spark ignites within Ejin as he observes his sister. Just a little while ago, in Ejin's class, Jadeong decided to play target practice with Yangchen by throwing an eraser at him and having a good chuckle. Yakchen, not wanting to miss out on the fun, borrowed a classmate's eraser and gave it his all to hit Yangchen, feeling quite proud of himself when he succeeded. Jadeong chimed in, claiming it was just a fluke shot, to which Yakchen countered by saying his aim was just too quick for Jadeong's liking. Not one to back down, he took another shot, only this time, Ejin unexpectedly walked into the line of fire and got hit. He shrugged it off and took his seat, unbothered. Jaehyeong, clearly irritated, complained about Ejin getting on his nerves, while Hyukshin suggested they teach him a lesson after school. Ejin inquires if Young Chan is good, and he replies with a quiver that he is. 
He then asks if Ejin is free after school, proposing they hang out and explore. However, Ejin has to decline as he needs to head home with his sister. Yeonchin probes if his sister is a new student too, only to discover she has been here before Ejin. Curious, Yeonchin asks for her name, and hearing her name he is left surprised, prompting Ejin to ask if he knows her, to which Yeonchin reveals she's being picked on. He explains that she was popular and smart back in middle school, but then a girl who was jealous of her started bullying her. Ejin asks why no one helped her. Yeonchan explains that the girl's brother is Jisoo Kim, a thug at their school. He further explains that things started to get bad for her in high school since they both were in the same class, and everyone is surprised that she is still attending school. Ejin asks if she's being bullied over something trivial, and Yeonchan explains that everything starts with a trivial reason, adding that bullies don't need a solid reason to target someone. Ejin remembers the day Grandpa excitedly informed him about starting school soon, and he hopes for a smooth adjustment. He reassures Grandpa as he asks Dayan about her school life. Dayan confidently reports back that she's acing it. Grandpa beams with pride knowing she's a top student with zero complaints from her teachers. Ejin also looks pleased. Back to the present, his thoughts are interrupted as Yang Chan asks if he is okay, and Ejin thanks him for telling him. Yeonchan reveals that everyone knows about it and hopes that Aijin is not too worried about it. Suddenly, a guy kicks the door open, startling the students. The fat guy and Hujin's brother enter, and Hyukshin asks what he is doing in his class. He says that he is here for some unfinished business, and Gyakshin knows that he can't take him on. The guy points at Aijin, revealing that he is the person who beat them. Hyukshin can't believe that they were beaten by a guy like him. Yusu tells Aijin to come to him, and he stands up. Jaegyeong knows that Aijin is dead now because he pissed Gisu off. Aijin questions if Gisu Kim is really him, catching Gisu off guard. Gisu gives him a stern look and signals his men to take action. Out of nowhere, Dayan shows up. Aijin shifts his attention to her, and Gisu remarks that Aijin's sister has arrived because she cares, unlike his own sister. Huijin enters the scene and tells Gisu to zip it, unleashing a rand of curses at Dayan for making her sprint over. Dayan with tears rolling down her cheeks, apologizes to Ejin for involving him in the chaos, but he reassures her that it's not her fault. He then throws a punch, knocking the guy out cold, leaving the others in shock. He then declares that it's the others who should be apologizing, not her. The fat guy dashes and curses him. Ejin dodges his punch and uses his palm to slap his neck, causing him to drop down. The other guy is scared and tries to punch him but misses, and Ejin beats him, knocking him out. Jisu is shocked by what just happened, and everyone is stunned. Ejin speaks in a cold tone that he heard his sister is having a hard time because of them, and they both flinch. Jisu decides to test Ejin's toughness, only to find out he's not just a walkover. Ejin chooses not to engage in words, but rather in action. As Jisu tries to physically test Ejin's strength, he is met with a shocking surprise when his kicks are effortlessly blocked. Ejin swiftly counterattacks by delivering a knockout blow to Jisoo, leaving him lying on the ground with blood trickling down. The classroom is left in awe as Jae Gyung and Hyakshin watch in disbelief at Ejin's unexpected display of power. Weijin is astonished by what just happened, and Ejin comes closer to them. He stares at her with his clenched fist. She wonders if he is going to hit her, but suddenly Dayin stops him. He reminds her that they have been bullying her, and she is left confused. He knows that they also did this to her today. Dayan is flushed and questions how he knew, wondering if he is fighting again because of her. She grins and assures him she's cool, putting a halt to his advance. He pauses and suggests they leave. She's puzzled, but he promises to escort her back to class. She trails behind him as they exit. The whole class is abuzz, shocked that Jisoo Kim's crew got wiped out by just one person. Jaegyeon is relieved that they didn't antagonize Ejin before. Yang Chan is speechless, while Huijin is physically shook and lets out a curse. While in the hallway, Dayan didn't consider himself a pro, and she gives yet another round of apologies. He questions the reason for her remorse, to which she confesses to pulling him into the chaos that ensued yesterday and today. He dismisses her apologies, saying that this is just how it goes. He recounts how people in his old neighborhood were all about self-interest, never caring for others unless it affected their own. The only time they showed compassion was when their own kin were in the mix. This made him ponder the meaning of family and why it held significance. Dayan mentions that he barely remembers them. He replies that it's true, but it doesn't change the fact that they are still family.
She is taken aback by all the onlookers, and she informs him that he can head back now as they have arrived at her class. She assures him they'll catch up later. He grins and heads back to his class. Upon entering, Jade Young and Hyakjin shower him with praise for his triumph against Jisoo's lackeys. Ijin sighs and takes his seat while Yangshin compliments his cool demeanor. In a different class, Jisoo slams the table, causing everyone to flinch. He remarks on Ijin's unique fighting style, prompting Huijin to suggest plotting their revenge for another day. He snaps at her, challenging her to fight if she thinks it's so easy. She fires back, refusing to be a scapegoat for their defeat. Jisoo glares at her, and she defiantly turns away, leaving the scene with a powerful slam. She is angry that they couldn't even handle one guy. She returns to her classroom and sees Dayan, commenting that she is lucky and mocking her that she can now come to school without any worries and can ask for her brother's help if something happens. Dayan ignores her, which makes Huijin mad, but she trembles while remembering Yi Jin. Still, she's determined not to let Dayan do what she wants. Dayan exits the school and recalls how Yi Jin saved her, Wondering if she can now attend school safely without being bullied, Ejin asks if something is wrong startling her. She asks if he was waiting for her again. He replies that he doesn't know the way back home. She suggests they stop by to get some groceries and he inquires if she needs to buy something. She explains that Grandpa gets hungry after work and is always happy when she prepares dinner for him. Observing them, Huijin glares at her, cursing and plotting something malicious. At the market, Dayun is indecisive about what to buy, and all the people are staring at Ejin. Dayun knows he was popular in school, but he also stands out in public. She asks him if he had a girlfriend back home, and he is confused and replies that he didn't. She asks why, given his popularity with the ladies. He explains that he was busy. She understands that he must be adjusting to an unfamiliar country. He asks her the same question. She is taken aback and replies with a resounding no. Ajin probes further, asking why not. She explains that she was also busy. At home, his grandpa gifts him a smartphone and tells him that all the kids have it, and they said it was good. It's the latest model phone, and he opens it up and uses it. Grandpa adds him that he has already saved his and Dayan's numbers in it. Dayan is surprised at how he did that because he always forgets things like these, and he explains that the shopkeeper helped him. She questions why he didn't ask the salesperson to do it for him. Grandpa reveals that he wanted to do it himself. Both of them are surprised, and he tells them that he heard that opening new things matters a lot to young people. He asks Ajin if it's alright that he opened the box to save their numbers. Ajin reassures him that it's fine. Grandpa then apologizes to Dayun, explaining that he couldn't get her a new phone because he bought one for Ajin, but promises to buy her a new one soon. She tells Grandpa there's no need, as her phone is still working fine. Ajin thanks him for the gift expressing how much he likes it. In his room, he's all smiles while on his phone. But at the academy, Kang's peace is suddenly interrupted by the ringing of his phone, a text message from Yi Jin. Kim sarcastically asks if Kang didn't just buy him a new phone, to which Kang replies that kids these days are so choosy. Kang then angrily argues that he got him the prissiest phone available, only for Kim to suggest that some kids have brand preferences. The next morning, Ejin comes out after taking a shower and sees Dayun leaving early again. She tells him to eat breakfast and leave the dishes in the sink. Dayun sprinted, glancing at the clock, only to find out she could actually make it on time. Turns out, making soup took longer than anticipated, but it was all worth it to see the smile on her grandpa's face. Suddenly, some people kick her. They are wearing masks, concealing their identities. They demand that she apologize, and she does. The girl slaps her and tells her to apologize properly. One of the girls proposes taking her to karaoke to beat her there, and she asks if Dayun will go with them. She recognizes the girl's voice, it's Hu Jin. After karaoke, the person in charge of the zone checks the room and sees Dayun lying inside in rough shape. He asks if she is alright. She tells him that she is fine and puts her stuff back in her bag. The person tells her to wait and that he will call an ambulance, but she insists that she is fine and steps out of the building. In her class, the teacher asks if anyone has seen Dayan, and a girl responds that she didn't come today. The teacher says that it's strange because she never misses a class without informing. Huijin smirks and her friend asks if they will be alright. Huijin assures her that they will be fine and all they did was teach her a lesson. She tells her to stop freaking out because it has nothing to do with them, and the friend calms down. School ends and Ijin can't find Dayan. He waits and waits but still doesn't see her. There is no one left in the school, and he wonders if she already left. 
so he calls her, but she doesn't pick up. Ejin enters home and sees her shoes. He knocks on her door and informs that he has come home, and she asks if he was waiting for her. He tells her that he was calling her, but she didn't answer. She explains that she was sleeping. Ejin knows something is wrong and asks if he can enter her room, but she refuses, lying to him that she is resting and not feeling well. He asks if she is sick and how bad it is. She informs him that it's a slight fever and she will get better after some rest. He tells her to let him know if she needs anything. He thinks of getting her some medicine and goes to the entrance, noticing her shoes covered in blood and a flicker of realization sparks within him. Sunlight flickers through the window, illuminating the room. On the bed lies a first aid kit, surrounded by bloodied bandages. Aijin asks his sister if she is okay. She tells him she is fine, though her injuries sting. Aijin cautions her to be more careful. He wonders if she truly fell down the stairs while dodging a bicycle, noting that her bruises suggest she collided into it. She nods with a smile, but Aijin, sensing her deceit, scrutinizes her face. He then asks if she really doesn't need to see a doctor. Dayan replies that she really doesn't need a doctor. This is because she knows that her lie will be exposed if she does. The scene shifts to the principal's office, where Huijin is arrogantly shouting at the police officers, demanding to know why they are questioning her about Dayan's injuries and why they are causing her trouble. Suddenly, Dayan interrupts, shouting that it was Huijin who pushed her. Huijin vehemently denies it, shouting, no. Dayan tells her that even though her face was covered, she knows it was her because of her distinctive voice. Huijin smirks and retorts that Dayan didn't see the culprit's face and is merely making assumptions. She suggests Dayan is doing this because she refuses to be friends with her. The principal intervenes, asking Dayan if she truly didn't see the culprit's face. Dayan, growing more agitated, shouts that she is certain it was Huijin. Her shouting provokes Huijin's mother, who bursts into anger and yells at her to shut up, accusing her of creating a huge problem over a ridiculous hunch. The principal, his voice trembling, asks the woman to calm down, but this only fuels her anger further. Dayun, now worried, wonders why no one believes her when she knows it was Hui Jin. Hui Jin's mother demands that she apologize to her daughter for the accusation. She looks straight into her eyes and firmly says that she is not lying. The woman, her expression stern and unwavering, addresses the principal about Dayun's behavior before abruptly turning to Dayun herself. With a sharp tone, she informs her that she will be meeting with her parents and instructs her to arrange their attendance. Dayan's eyes widen in shock, feeling as though the ground has crumbled beneath her feet. Memories flood her mind of similar instances where her voice had gone unheard, her truth disregarded due to lack of evidence. Suddenly, a voice breaks through her reverie. It is a jinn, calling her name with concern. He asks if she is okay. Dayan snaps back to reality blinking away the disorienting rush of memories. She manages to reply that she is fine, her voice trembling slightly. Hyjin approaches calmly, his face a mix of worry and empathy. Your bones seem intact, but those bruises will take some time to heal, he reassures, placing a comforting hand on her arm. Dayan nods weakly, grateful for Hyjin's reassuring presence in the midst of her turmoil. When Dayan's attention shifts to the bandage, she is taken aback and compliments Hyjin on his skill. He asks if she feels comfortable, and she replies that it's perfect, but her concern is her grandfather, who has a weak heart and might worry if he finds out. Understanding her worry, Ajin assures her he will take care of her grandfather. He suggests she rest and begins to leave. Just as he's about to go, Dayan calls out to him and thanks him, causing Ajin to smile genuinely. After he leaves, she wonders if she made the right choice by not confiding in him further, as there's nothing a bunch of teenagers can do. After leaving the room, Ejin's face becomes flushed with anger and frustration. The scene then transitions to a loud, music-filled bar where Jisoo's face is contorted with rage. A friend approaches him, inquiring how Ejin managed to defeat all of them, including Gisu himself. He remains silent, fueling his friend's questions about their next move. They lament underestimating Ejin and discuss how they could have taken him down if they had planned better beforehand. They decide they can't sit idly by and must seek revenge. Gishu's anger boils over as he reflects over the humiliation he faced. He resolved to exact revenge the next day using their full force. Just then, his phone rings and he answers arrogantly, demanding to know what's happening. On the other end, his sister asks if he's still at the club with his foolish friends and reminds him of a debt he owes her. Confused, he asks what she means. She explains that she fought Aijin's sister out of sheer indignation from the humiliation caused by her. 
Jisu smiles and tells Hijin that she is just like him. He praises her, revealing that they are also planning to take Ajin down. Suddenly, he hears the sound of footsteps approaching. As the figure draws closer, Jisu realizes it is Ajin. Infuriated, he shouts, demanding how dare he enter his territory. His sister, still on the line, becomes confused and asks what is happening. He smirks as Ijin approaches. He tells him, it's good you're here. I have been eagerly waiting for a rematch. As soon as Ijin reaches the door, he delivers a powerful punch to the man standing in front of it, knocking him out instantly. Jisu's anger boils over, and he orders his men to beat him to a pulp. However, the situation takes an unexpected turn. Ajin fights back ferociously, defeating everyone and leaving them crying out in pain. Gisu stares in disbelief as he effortlessly dodges every attack from his men, swiftly bringing each of them to the ground. He can't fathom how Ijin has managed to get there. Meanwhile, Hijin's frantic shouts echo through the phone, trying to make sense of the chaos. With his attackers defeated, Ijin turns his attention to Gisu, his eyes blazing with fury. He feels a chill run down his spine as Ijin's gaze locks onto him, leaving him trembling in fear. Ijin approaches slowly, his presence radiating menace. He shouts at him, demanding how many times he has to make it clear that he should not touch his sister. Jusu begins to analyze Ajin's strategy, realizing that he had first taken out the guards outside, forcing him and his men to confront him directly. It had taken Ajin only a few seconds to assess the room. In an instant, he realizes that he is no match for him. Ajin stands before him and coldly inquires what his sister has done to deserve this treatment. Jisu, panicking, stammers that he doesn't know what he is talking about. In a desperate move, he throws a glass of water at him. Hejin easily dodges the attack, enraging him further. Grabbing another bottle, Jisu charges at him in a blind fury. However, Ijin effortlessly deflects his attacks, making each one futile. In a swift move, he smashes Jisu's arm, causing him to recoil in pain. However, he doesn't let up and continues attacking. After a while, Jisu is completely worn out, panting heavily, while Ijin remains unscathed, his gaze steady and unwavering. Ijin then asks him why he harasses such a helpless girl. Jisu, having reached the limit of his anger, shatters the bottle in his hand and charges at Ijin, threatening to kill him. In a swift move, Ajin smashes Jisu's arm once again, causing him to drop the bottle. As Gizu's attack falters, he seizes him by the neck with a tight grip, making it difficult for him to breathe. Jisu can do nothing but see the inwardly, his rage turning to silent curses. Aijin looks directly into his eyes and coldly inquires what he should do with him. He then pushes him to the sofa, choking him almost to death. He lets him know that this is his last warning. He won't get the same mercy if he tries to harm his sister again. He tells him to make it clear to his sister as well. If she tries anything, he will be back to kill him. Jisu tries to get out of his hold, but it's all in vain. Ajin then warns him that next time he wouldn't be alive if something happens to his sister. With that said, he finally lets him go and begins to walk away. Elsewhere, Jisu's sister attempts to reach him on the phone, growing increasingly anxious as he fails to respond. She heads towards the club. As she nears the stairs, she becomes startled at the sound of approaching footsteps. Her heart races as Ijin emerges, causing her eyes to widen in fear. She gathers herself quickly, hoping he hasn't discovered her involvement in the altercation with his sister. With a mix of fear and defiance, she shouts at him to stay back. In her haste, she stumbles and injures her arm. Just then, Ajin's phone rings. It's his grandpa who asks him to come back home. Huijin is left standing in complete shock, realizing the precarious situation she narrowly avoided. She watches with fear in her eyes, his departure leaving her trembling. She gathers herself and descends the stairs, her dread intensifying as she sees Jisu's friends sprawled on the floor, bloodied and motionless. Approaching her brother, she demands to know what has happened, her voice rising in panic. She asks if they got beaten up by Aijin again. Jisu remains calm, sternly instructing her to stay away from Aijin's sister and never interfere with her again. Huijin, now angry and confused, demands an explanation for his words. Jisu's frustration boils over, and he shouts at her to heed his warning. Unable to comprehend the situation, Huijin mocks her brother, calling him a coward. Jisu, seething with anger, insists he has nothing more to say and demands a straight answer from her. She defiantly refuses, further provoking Gisu. His rage peaks, Jisu's eyes blazing red as he warns Huijin in a chilling tone. He threatens that if he even suspects she is approaching Aijin's sister again, he will personally kill her. 
Huijin recoils in fear, realizing the gravity of her brother's threat. Elsewhere, as Aijin emerges onto the dark street outside his house, he spots his grandpa standing beneath the streetlight, waiting for him. The old man immediately apologizes, lamenting that he has wasted Aijin's time. Aijin reassures him, saying it is okay since he wasn't doing anything important. With a heavy heart, grandpa asks about Dayan's injuries. Aijin explains that he has treated her, but the injuries from falling down the stairs seem severe. Grandpa suspects that these injuries aren't accidental, however, Dayan refuses to go to the hospital, so there is no way to confirm. He opens up about his struggles about caring for Dayan alone. He confesses he didn't know how to raise her and spent most of his time outside working to put food on the table. He struggles to understand her needs, but still, he is grateful she has made it this far. He reveals that after losing his family in an accident, Dayan became his only reason to keep going. However, seeing her in such a state makes him deeply sad. Moreover, she doesn't confide in him, perhaps thinking him too old to understand. The gap between Dayan and her grandparents has widened as she has grown older. After hearing Grandpa's heartfelt confession, Aijin calls out to him, acknowledging that even though they haven't spent much time together, it was clear from the beginning how much he loves Dayan. He reassures Grandpa that he will also look after her at school. Grandpa gazes at Aijin's face, his expression softening as Aijin assures him. A smile spreads across his face as he thanks Aijin, expressing his deep happiness at having him back in their lives. At the hospital, Gisu is in worse condition. His father knew that Gisu would get into trouble again, attributing it all to the misdeeds Jisu had committed. Gisu's mother yells at his father, informing him that Gisu is hospitalized and questioning if this is all he can say for him. She urges him to find the person responsible for Gisu's condition and reprimand him, pointing out what has happened to their daughter. Gisu's mother tells him to rest and recover soon, and they both leave. Gisu asks Hujin why she told them about the incident, expressing that now he is in more trouble and feels humiliated because everyone will think he ran to his parents after getting badly beaten up. Hujin questions what else she could have done and how she could have hidden her broken arm from them. Gisu asks if Aijin really broke her arm, and she admits that he did. But it's a white lie. She tells him to stay and rest, assuring him that she will make them realize who they are dealing with. In the hospital hallway, Jisu's wife tells him that she contacted Mr. Cha. He responds that she is complicating things and suggests letting the school handle it. She insists that she cannot just sit and wait, pointing out that the school will only give a minor punishment like suspension or expulsion. He tells her she doesn't need to go as far as contacting Mr. Cha. She retorts that she knows Cha has been handling his dirty work for years, and she has explained the situation to him. He will handle it. Huijin overhears their conversation and smirks, knowing Mr. Cha is a scary gangster working for his father, and this would be the end of Aijin. At a warehouse, the gangster subordinates express annoyance over having to teach a teenager a lesson. Another guy tells him to quiet down because the boss can hear him. Cha is frustrated, recalling the president's wife's request for him to handle Ijin personally because her son was sent to the hospital and her daughter has a fractured wrist. Cha curses his life now that he has to meddle in the affairs of teenagers. At Aijin's home, he wonders if they will stop after his warning. Suddenly, the doorbell rings. He hears noises outside and some people wanting to talk to him. Grandpa asks why they want to talk this late at night. Aijin quickly steps out, assuring his grandpa that he will be back soon. They worry about him, but he tells them to stop worrying because they are his friends. They take Aijin to an abandoned area, making him wonder who could be after him. They bring him to the boss and inform him that Aijin didn't resist and came along. As a reward, Cha promises to make it quick. One of the gangsters takes out a metal bat, and he tells him to grab Aijin by the arm. Cha thinks of texting the president's wife to inform her it's done. They tell Aijin it will be quick but painful, pitying him for messing with Kim Gisu. He finally realizes it was all about Gisu. Cha gets annoyed that they revealed the reason to Aijin and resolves to teach them a lesson afterward. He notices that Aijin doesn't look scared at all. Suddenly, Aijin grabs one of the gangster's arms and attacks. Another curses and lunges with the bat, but Aijin dodges and strikes again. Cha is confused by Aijin charging towards the bat. Aijin stops the bat and lands a punch, destroying him. Cha is impressed by his techniques. Another gangster grabs Aijin, but he jabs him and knocks him down. Cha never thought he would face a teenager with such skill. It becomes obvious Aijin is not an average high schooler. Aijin reads Cha's movements and dodges his punches. Finding an opening, he goes for a punch, but Che changes its trajectory. 
Hijin quickly blocks it, saving himself. Chebi comes impressed that Aijin blocked the attack. Aijin glances at his bruised wrist, wondering if Cha anticipated his move. He questions Aijin's identity. Aijin responds, claiming to be just a high schooler. However, he knows he's lying, recognizing his experience in actual combat. Aijin gets ready, and Che strikes again. This time, Aijin counters, grabs his arm, and deals a massive blow. Cha is shocked by Aijin's tactics, using Cha's own attacks against him. He gets mad and punches again, but Aijin easily blocks and quickly delivers three punches, knocking him down. He curses at being beaten by a teenager. He notices Aijin's eyes and realizes he didn't even see it as a fight. Cha realizes that they messed with the wrong person. At Inbei Kim's building, Jisoo's mother grows impatient, waiting for news from Cha. He tells her to wait, explaining that Cha will call when he's done. Suddenly, the phone rings and she tells him to put it on speaker. He apologizes to Cha, burdening him with this task. However, he tells him he should be the one apologizing, leaving them confused. He reveals they messed with the wrong person and he was destroyed by Aijin. They are shocked, unable to believe a high school kid could defeat him. Suddenly, the door opens, and they see the guards lying on the floor. They are shocked to see him. He confidently enters the offers, having defeated all the guards. Cha, sitting in his car, cannot believe that Aijin got to them so quickly, and is genuinely curious about Aijin's identity. He sighs, acknowledging that it still does not change the fact that he got destroyed by a kid and curses. Aijin enters the office, and they are shocked to see him. Huijin's mother yells at him, and Inbei tells her to behave herself. He asks Ijin how he entered the office, and Aijin reveals that he entered after dealing with the so-called bodyguards he hired for his own safety who couldn't even stop him. Inbei wonders if Aijin really managed to beat Cha and all his security, and what bothers him most is how Aijin found out about his location. His wife tells Aijin not to give them that attitude just because he beat some people and threatens to call the police for assaulting her kids and other things. Huijin smirks, agreeing that his mother is right, and although Ijin might be strong, he won't be able to do anything against the law. She tells him she will call the district attorney, claiming he has no idea who he is dealing with. Ijin reveals that he knows who her husband is, and she tells him that he doesn't understand what the real world means, and that he shouldn't have messed with them. Huijin sneers and mumbles. Game over. She calls the police, and Ijin plays the video of Huijin beating his sister. They are all shocked, and she cuts the call. Huijin asks how he got those videos. He ignores her and recalls the place where he got those videos from. Huijin tries to explain to her dad, but he tells her to shut her mouth. Huijin further reveals that he also has videos of Gisu, and for some reason they keep videos of their dirty work. He reveals that some clips show them beating kids and stealing money and valuables from their victims. Huijin trembles in fear. Her mother tells Huijin not to threaten them and insists he cannot get away with this. Aijin explains that he wasn't the one who started all this, and this is hardly a threat compared to hiring a bunch of gangsters to assault him, and he has also recorded that. Inbei asks if he did this because his children bullied his sister. Aijin explains that as their parents, they will take their kid's side, and as a brother, he will do whatever it takes to protect his sister. Inbei admits defeat and says that he will pay for the treatments and give them a hefty sum of money to make amends. Aijin says that he doesn't need it, and Inbei is confused and asks what he really wants, questioning if he wants his kids to apologize to them. Huijin says she would rather die than apologize. Aijin replies that it won't be necessary because an apology won't bring back the time she had to spend in pain, and what he really wants is that his sister never has to see the faces of Huijin and Jisoo ever again. Inbei hurriedly accepts his request and says that he will send them abroad. They both scream and he tells them to shut up. He asks Ijin if that would be enough and Aijin wants them to be gone by tomorrow. Her father says that he will inform the school. Aijin starts to leave, but Inbei stops him and demands that Aijin hand over all the videos he has. Aijin gives him a cold look, and Inbei starts trembling. Aijin reminds him in a cold tone that he is not an idiot, and Inbei apologizes, and he leaves. He enters home, and both of them are worried and waiting for him. Grandpa asks if he is hurt and Aijin smiles, reassuring them that he is fine and healthy, and they were his friends who stopped by to talk. Dayan tells him that they look dangerous, so they were worried about him. Aijin tells her to worry about herself, and asks if she is feeling better, and she says that she is alright. Aijin tells her she shouldn't worry anymore because she would never have to fall down the stairs again, and he reveals that he got rid of everything.
The next day, Dayan tells Ijin that he doesn't have to walk her to class now because she is fine, and he agrees. She enters the class and hears the students talking that Hujin will not be coming to school anymore. Dayan is shocked that she is moving abroad and finally understands what Ijin was talking about last night. He knew the whole story. Dayan stops Ijin but doesn't know what to say to him. He tells her that he will see her later, and she starts crying. In the karaoke room, one of Huijin's friends asks if it's true that she is moving abroad, and another says she was shocked when she heard the news but doesn't know why she's going there. Another asks if she didn't need her at school. She explains that she didn't see Huijin and Gisu at school. They ask Hayong if she isn't going to say anything startling her. She repeats what she said and asks if she isn't in the same class as Huijin. Ayong confirms that it's true news and that their teacher also announced it. They ask if she tried calling her. Ayong replies that Huijin isn't picking up her calls and hasn't read any of her text messages. Ayong lost contact with her after that message and wonders if her moving has anything to do with Aijin but dismisses the thought, believing her parents would have taken care of the matter. The girls are sad because they have lost Huijin, who was their money bag. Suddenly, Huijin appears and they are all shocked. Huijin curses, saying she finally got out of her home. They ask if she is really going abroad, and she explains that it happened very quickly, but she is only going for one semester. Huijin's father told her to spend a semester there and that he would take care of things in that time because he cannot let the world see those videos. They smirk, realizing she is just going on a vacation, and one of them asks if Jisoo is going too. Huijin reveals that it's a family matter and that they shouldn't know about it. She can't tell them because of the humiliation. They ask what happened to the girl and her brother, and she cannot tell them because Jisoo will kill her, so she just lies. Huijin curses Aijin because she has to bear all the humiliation because of him, and she cannot see Dayan happy, so she tells them they should beat her one more time. She reveals that Dayan will become cocky after she leaves, so she is just taking care of the job before she leaves. They are confused, and Huijin reveals that Dayan's grandpa is a security guard somewhere, and she will have her mom get him fired which will teach Dayan a lesson. She curses her. Suddenly, Aijin appears, saying he is glad he came here, and Huijin is shocked to see him in panics, saying his name. He says he doesn't know who Aijin is. The others are confused about why he came here. Aijin reveals that he came to see what type of fun they were having and identifies all the people from the video. They try to play dumb, saying they don't know. Aijin inquires if this is the same place where they filmed Dayan, and they all tremble in fear. Aijin, in a cold tone, asks why no one is singing because they like to scream along to loud music, and he slowly closes the door. In the hospital, Inbei cannot find Hujin, and Jisoo reveals that she went out to say goodbye to her friends. He is mad that she should have stayed still until they got on the plane. Suddenly, his assistant enters and tells him that he needs to see something and switches on the television. The news channel is talking about his kids and their crimes, showing videos of their misdeeds. They are shocked to see it, and the reporter reveals that the criminals are the children of candidate Inba Kim. Aijin is walking down the street when Chess stops him and inquires why he leaked the video because he thought he had a deal with Inba Kim. Aijin was under the radar, protecting his identity while up against a powerful opponent. He had to do it quietly and thought it would be over if he could just get them out of Dayan's way. He lies to Cha, saying he is petty. Cha asks if that is his excuse and if he really thinks he will get away with this. Aijin reveals that he is sure this will be the last time. Back at the hospital, the news reporter reveals that Inbe Kim was involved in money laundering and other significant crimes. The evidence is very conclusive, and even his party members are against him now. He falls down in shock. Back to Aijin, Cha asks if he used the data he had collected on Inbe. Cha questions his identity, and he explains that he is a normal teenager. Cha snickers, saying there is not a single thing about him that is average. The next day at school, the girls discussed Aijin. Suddenly, his phone rings and he sees the text messages Dayan sent. She tells him she will go home by herself and that he can hang out with his friends. Aijin is confused about how to do that. Young Chin appears and greets him, glancing at Aijin and asking if he is busy today because he usually has to walk home with his little sister. Aijin reveals he is free today and Young Chin asks if he wants to hang out after school. Hayukshin interrupts their conversation, revealing they heard the reason Jisoo is moving abroad is because of Aijin, but now he won't be leaving the country because of the case. Aijin lies to them, saying they heard it wrong, and Jade Yang tells him to stop being modest, as they know he beat Jisoo and his puppets at his hideout a couple of days ago. 
Hayukshin reveals Jisoo was very humiliated to come back and asks Ijin how badly he beat him to make him leave the country. Yongshin guesses Ijin is really good at this and that the incident in the class was not a fluke. Hayukshin says they should celebrate the victory, and Jade Yong says it's his treat since they still haven't hung out. Ijin apologizes, saying he has plans to hang out with Yongchan. They tell him they will join them in that case, and since Yongchan is scared of them, he agrees without hesitation. Ijin asks if he is sure about this, and Yongchan confirms that he is. The teacher tells the students to quiet down, and two new students enter the class. Yongchan recognizes them, and Ijin asks if he knows them. He reveals that the girl is Yona Sin, and her grandfather owns Southwest Corporation, the largest company in Korea. The guy next to her is Sepchuko, who is trained to be her assistant and bodyguard. The teacher explains they have been studying in America for two years and will be joining their class from today. The bullies' faces turn pale, considering stopping their actions. The students are mesmerized by her beauty. Seokchu notices Ai-jin and Yona also notices him, asking about him. Seokchu is unsure because Ai-jin wasn't in the report and promises to check it again. She looks at him, and Ai-jin glances at her but then turns back and ignores her. Yangchen asks if Ai-jin knows any place he wants to go, but he doesn't. He proposes the idea of going to a game room, and Ai-jin is surprised. He remembers Major Kang telling him about it when he was training him to live in Korea as a teenager. A game room allows anyone to use their systems for a certain amount of money, with some people surfing the internet while students mostly play games. Major Kang had also explained the most common games played. Aijin trusts the information given to him by the Major. Yang Chan says they will also eat ramen and go to a Koinka, also known as Coin Karaoke. Koinka was also a Major's information and he had explained it to him. Aijin takes it seriously and feels nervous about it. After school ends, Seopju tells Yona that Aijin is a transfer student, 18 years old, and the older brother of Daeyeon. Yona thought her grandpa was her only family. Seopju explains that Aijin's parents and brother died in a plane crash, but his brother came back to life right before their return to school. Seopju is suspicious about his identity and proposes they should investigate more. Aijin is on his way back home after hanging out in the game room. His phone starts buzzing, and he checks it to see the text messages from his friends in the new group chat. The scene shifts back to the game room. Hayakshin is surprised at how Yongshin carried them through the game and cleaned up all the mess Aijin made. Jade Yong questions him if it is his secondary account. He replies that he has a separate main account. Jade Yong inquires about his rank on his main account, and he replies that he's a challenger. This news shocks them because they never thought they had a pro among their midst. Aijin is confused unaware of the gaming scene. The scene transitions back to the present. In the chat, Jae Yong tells him that he needs to practice more because he is very bad at the game. Unexpectedly, he runs into Dayeon. He inquires what she is doing out so late. She explains that they ran out of trash bags, and she also wanted to buy some snacks. He offers to carry them, but she replies that there is no need since they are not that heady. She asks if he was hanging out with his friends, and he replies with a yes, Dayan is glad that he has made new friends because she was worried that no one would talk to him after the school fight incident. She asks where they went, and he tells her that they went to a game room. Dayan is stunned because she thought Aijin would have different interests since he lived overseas for a long time. He asks about her school life. She tells him he doesn't need to worry, she is enjoying school. He feels glad to hear that. She asks him if he has eaten dinner. He lets her know that the game room sold many types of food, so he ate there. Turning the question around, he asks if she has eaten anything herself. She replies that she hasn't because she has been waiting for grandpa so they can eat together. Aijin asks if he can also join them. She is left confused, recalling his earlier statement that he has already eaten. He makes up the excuse that he ate only a little bit and he is hungry again. Back at home, grandpa compliments Dayeon, saying her cooking skills are improving day by day. She modestly responds that it is just a simple dish and leftover soup. However, Grandpa insists and asks Ijin for his opinion as well. He responds that the food is very good. They all laugh and enjoy their time together. Suddenly, memories of his life overseas flash through Ijin's mind. He ignores them and goes back to his room. Suddenly, his phone rings. He picks it up to find Major Kang on the other end. Kang tells him to drop the formality and asks how he is doing. He asks about his school life as well. Ijin doesn't respond immediately prompting Kane to ask if he has killed someone. They begin to panic, wondering what they will do. Ijin quickly clarifies that he didn't kill anyone. 
He explains that he encountered some problems at school, but they have been resolved. Kang asks if he is really fine and if there is anything he can do for him. He assures him that everything is fine and he doesn't need to worry. Kang is relieved and tells him that they are always there to help. The next morning at school, Jaegyeon, Yangshin, and Hayukshin discuss Aijin's absence and criticize his poor gaming skills. Out of nowhere, Jaegyeon asks who would win if Sukchu and Aijin got into a fight. Hayukshin acknowledges that Aijin is strong, but insists there is no way he could win against Sukchu because he has been training since childhood. One is a pro and the other is a rookie. Jaehyeong sighs and agrees, noting that Seokchu is a tough opponent. Yeongchin asks if it is true that Seokchu fought against 20 guys in one. Hayukshin corrects him, saying it was 30 guys. Jaehyeong explains that it started when a group of guys were harassing Yona Sai, and it escalated from 10 to 30, but even then they were no match for him. Yeongchin inquires about another incident, and Hayukshin suggests it might also be true, concluding that Aijin doesn't stand a chance against him. Meanwhile, Aijin arrives at school and encounters Sukju, who stares at him. He asks who he is, to which Aijin responds that he doesn't understand the question. Seokju clarifies, asking why he is lying about his identity. He reveals that there are rumors about Aijin's involvement in Gisu and Hyujin Kim moving away. Aijin admits he fought with them but denies any role in their departure. He further reveals that he contacted the school Aijin supposedly attended overseas, and they claimed never to have such a student. Aijin remains silent. Meanwhile, in Dayan's class, Yona approaches her, leaving her surprised. She didn't know Yona was back in Korea. Yona tells her that she started school yesterday and is in her brother's classroom. She mentions that she doesn't remember Dayan having a brother. Dayan explains that they thought he had died with her parents in the plane crash. But it turns out he was still alive. They received news of his survival only six months ago. The scene shifts to the past, where her grandpa was holding the phone and shivering. She asked him about it, and with tears in his eyes, he told her that her brother Aijin was alive. Back to the present, Yona questions why he didn't reach out to them if that was the case. Dayan reveals that Aijin lost his memory in the plane crash, and they said he recently began to remember things and someone helped them find him. Yona is stunned that he started regaining his memories just recently. She further reveals that it's only a faint memory of having a grandpa and a younger sister. Yona smiles and says that her grandpa must have been really happy. She explains that as soon as he heard the news, he burst into tears. He immediately took time off from work and started learning to cook. Yona is confused, so she explains that he was trying to better his Korean cooking since her brother didn't have much growing up. Yona comments that her grandpa is very caring, and Dayan smiles. In a serious tone, Yona asks if she is sure that he really is her brother, leaving her confused. Yona asks if they checked everything to make sure. She explains that they even took a DNA test to be certain. On top of that, Grandpa told her that he still looks the same as he did when he was little. After hearing about the DNA test, Yona is left confused. Dayan inquires why she is asking about her brother. Unable to answer, she quickly asks if he has a girlfriend, leaving to leave the impression that she is interested in him. Meanwhile, Ajin is still having his conversion with Sukju. He asks him to clarify what he is trying to say. Seopchu interrogates him, asking why it's so important for him to be at this school that he even forged his records. Ajin asks if he is saying that his records are fake. In a confident tone, Seopchu asserts that they must be fake because according to the data, Ajin never lived in that city. Even the school he claims to have attended doesn't know his name. Ajin asks if he has any evidence. Seopchu is stunned. Aijin explains that if he is claiming the records he submitted are fake, then he needs to provide evidence. Seopchu is cornered because he only asked people at the school using his connections, but doesn't have solid proof. But he is sure Aijin never went there. Meanwhile, Aijin is asking for proof with a straight face, making it seem like Seopchu is falsely accusing him. In a cold tone, he asks why he was running a background check on him. Seopchu responds that he cannot sit around watching a suspicious person who might be a danger. The atmosphere gets tense, and Aijin breaks the silence, telling him that he was coming back home. Seokchu asks what he means. Aijin replies that he asked why he came here, and that's his answer, then leaves. Seokchu says that now he has the answer, and it won't be long before he finds out. In class, the teacher is instructing, and Aijin notices the empty seats, thinking about the conversation with Seokchu and how he managed to find all that information in less than a day. The school day ends, 
and they plan to go to the game room again, asking if Ejin will come. Ejin excuses himself for today because it's his grandpa's birthday. They go by themselves to hang out. The scene shifts to Yona and Sukju. He tells her that Ijin Yu forged his documents, thinks the DNA test was tampered with, and reveals another thing he found out about Dayan in his research. He discloses that she was severely bullied by Jisoo Kim and his sister over the past two years. Yona is stunned and asks how bad the impact was. He reveals that it made him wonder how she stayed in the school and that her video was not released in the news but was just as bad. He thinks that is why Ijin made his move, revealing that Gisu Kim and his men were ambushed twice by Ijin. Yona is confused that her brother came back to life, destroyed her bullies, and seems more like a guardian angel, different from her siblings who are trying to kill her. Yona tells him something doesn't make sense. If she were Ijin's target, he would have kept a low profile. Siepchu agrees, and Yona wonders if there is something he would want from Dayan's family. She asks about the insurance money from the plane crash, and he tells her that Grandpa never touched it, returned Ijin's share to the company upon his return, and there is still a lot of money left, so they should consider that possibility. Yona tells him that Dayan could be in danger because she is living with Ijin. The scene shifts to a store where the siblings are shopping. Dayan asks about his life after the plane crash. He looks at her and worriedly, she tells him that he doesn't need to tell if he is not comfortable. He tells her that he is okay, explaining that he was pretty traumatized, couldn't think about anything, and did everything he could to survive in a place where he didn't even know the language, saying he stayed very busy there. Dayan chuckles, remarking that he was too busy to even have a girlfriend, and he smiles. Dayan tells him that she heard Yona's sin is in his class. Ijin is confused, and she says she was surprised when Yona told her. Ijin asks if she knows her. Dayan explains that Yona was very nice to her before she moved to the U.S., and she really missed her and was happy to see her again. Dayan tells him that Yona asked if he had a girlfriend. Ijin is dumbfounded. They wish their grandpa a happy birthday and tell him to open the gift. He tells them they shouldn't have given him a gift because they get very little money for allowance. Dayan smiles and tells him they have more than enough, and it was not that expensive. Grandpa tells her that he already got his present. Ijin, back to them safe and sound. While sitting at the dinner table, Dayan's phone rings and she goes to check it. The caller is Yona. Ijin notices something strange going on, and Dayan tells Grandpa that she is going out to the convenience store. Grandpa asks her why, and Dayan explains that Yona came by to chat with her. He remembers Yona, and Dayan steps out while Ijin glances at her. In his room, Ijin looks at the Southwest Corporation site and wonders why they are investigating him. It's very peculiar for them to be running background checks on a transfer student. He reflects on his conversation with Sukju. His grandpa tells him that he is going out for a minute. Aijin asks if it's because of Dayan. Grandpa explains that it is, and it would be nice to get some fresh air. Aijin offers to go instead, but grandpa insists it's unnecessary. Aijin reminds him that he has to work early tomorrow and should rest, mentioning he also needs something from the store, so he will go and walk back home with Dayan. Grandpa asks if he needs money, but Aijin says he has some allowance left. Grandpa tells him to be safe. Yona discusses American schools with Dayan, highlighting how they emphasize after-school activities. Dayan responds that it sounds fun. Yona counters that it can be problematic at times and asks if Dayan has considered studying abroad, noting many students their age are interested in such programs. Dayan admits she has never considered it before. Yona inquires why. Dayan explains that it costs a lot and she would have to live there for years, meaning she couldn't stay with her grandparents. Yona is puzzled and points out that her grandpa isn't in good health. Dayan says that having her brother around has relieved the burden on her, and she smiles. Yona struggles to bring up the topic and recalls her conversation with Sikshu, who informed her that an employee from the supposed school testified that Aijin was not a student there. They even reviewed his picture and confirmed he never attended. He further reveals that Aijin's address is fake and that he had solid proof. Yona tells Sikshu to go. He asks where. She tells him they will inform Dayan about it. Siopshu argues that forged records don't prove he isn't her real brother and insists they are doing this for Yona's safety, not Dayan's. Yona counters that Ijin's records of being missing for 10 years are fake and Dayan is living in the same house as him. She questions if Siopshu expects her to stay silent. Siopshu looks at her. She asserts that they must tell her what they know because she has the right to know the truth. That's why she came to see her, but Dayan keeps smiling whenever she mentions her brother. 
Dayan tells Yona she is happy to talk like this as she hasn't had such a conversation in a long time. Dayan has been severely bullied for a long time. Aijin notices them from afar and moves toward them. Suddenly, Sipchu blocks his path. Aijin tries to bypass him, but Sipchu stops him, thinking Aijin might be there because he fears they will inform Dayan. This is why he avoided trouble, and Sipchu thinks to himself that Yona is right. They can't let her friend get hurt. Siepchu tells Aijin it won't take long to catch him once everything is confirmed. He explains to Aijin that they need time to catch up, so he should give them a minute. Suddenly, a van appears and hits them before they can react. They both fall and get hurt. Aijin tries to get up and sees that they are kidnapping his sister. Aijin runs toward them, but they get away. They both catch their breath and grab each other's collars. Aijin demands to know where they have taken them, and Siepchu retorts that he was going to ask him the same question. This clears up the misunderstanding that Aijin is not behind the kidnapping. They let go of each other, and Siokshu reports the situation, instructing his team to track the vehicle. Aijin leaves. Siokshu tells him to wait, asking for the truth and questioning if he had nothing to do with this. Hijin coldly replies that he has no time to waste on him. Siokshu tells him that Southwest Corp Security is tracking them, and that Aijin needs to stay with him until his identity is confirmed. Aijin, covered in blood, tells him to look for Yona with his team while he finds his sister, adding that Sukchu can follow him if he wants. Siepchu now understands that Aijin wasn't behind it. Aijin turns back and asks if Sukchu brought a car. In a club area inside a room, Mr. Cha is smoking a cigarette, and his man informs him that some kid is here to see him. He asks which kid, and Aijin enters. A woman sits in her office, analyzing reports. A man in a suit knocks on the door and hurriedly enters the room. The woman asks what the emergency is that couldn't wait until she told him to come in. The man tells her that Yona has been kidnapped. She is stunned, and he informs her that they just received the news from the security team. The woman smirks and says that the rumors were true after all. She questions the man in the suit if her grandfather will continue to pursue the deal. He answers that he is not sure. She hopes that he doesn't give in to the threats and just continues on, and she tells herself that this way Yona will also die. The scene shifts back to Cha and Aijin. Siokchu recognizes the man as Dushik Cha and notes that he is flagged in their database for organized crime. He wonders how Aijin knows a person like him. Cha asks what Aijin wants, and Aijin tells him that he needs some information. Cha gets annoyed and says that he should stop joking. He tells him the news that the granddaughter of Southwest Corporation has been kidnapped. Cha tells him that he didn't do it and that they don't deal with things like that, adding it would be suicide to mess with Southwest Corp. Ijin asks if he has any clues, and Che says why he should tell him when he is stuck in this mess because of him. Ijin reveals that his younger sister was also kidnapped. Che gets frustrated, sighs, and tells him that some people who were speaking broken Korean were asking for an untraceable warehouse. They also asked for a few burner cars and some members for help. The offer was tempting, but he turned them down and lights up a new cigarette. He tells him that he got some news that another crew accepted the offer and that they are operating out of Incheon. Siokchu listens without saying a word, and Aijin thanks him for the information. Cha tosses his phone to him and tells Aijin to say it is number in his. He stares at him, and Che tells him that he needs his number and that he will look into the warehouse and tell him new intel. Aijin saves his number and asks if the bike parked outside is his. Outside the hideout, Aijin starts the bike and tells Siokchu that he is taking the bike and that he should find some other way. Siokshu asks if he is going to chase a weak lead like that. He tells him that Yona would be safe until they get what they need, but he doesn't know what they will do to Dayan. Siokshu looks at him and says that he is quick and perceptive and that he even came straight to this place to get a lead. He can't figure Aijin out. Siokshu informs Aijin that he has told the security team and that he will follow him by car. Aijin tells him that he can do what he wants. Aijin revs the bike and leaves the area at full speed. In the warehouse, Dayan wakes up and Yona apologizes to her for being dragged into her mess. Dayan doesn't understand and suddenly remembers that they have been kidnapped. Yona tells her that she didn't think this would happen as soon as she returned to Korea. She explains that this wasn't why she wanted to see her. Dayan looks at the kidnappers, and they say that they have finally woken up. Yona asks why they kidnapped her, and their leader tells her to shut her mouth and stay quiet. It will be over soon. Yona wonders if he is trying to use her against her grandpa or Southwest Corp. One of the members asks what to do with Dayon because she was with Yona, and they also got her. He orders them to kill her because she is of no use. 
Dayan gets frightened, and Yona yells that she won't let them hurt her. The leader asks what she can do about it. Yona threatens them that she will bite her tongue and bleed herself to death, and then they won't get what they came for. He laughs and says that she will die to save someone else and tells her to try it. The guy gets shocked because she actually does it. He tells her that her little trick got her some time, and the members ask what they will do. He orders them to kill her later and stuff a cloth in her mouth so she couldn't scream. Aijin reaches an area with a lot of containers, and Sukju follows him. He asks if this is the place. Aijin tells Sukju that this is the address Chaes sent to him. Siukju says that his lead wasn't bad and that the Southwest team also tracked the footage of the van to this location. Aijin gets ready to move, and Siukju tells him to wait for the Southwest team. Aijin says that Dayan doesn't have much time left. There are gangsters guarding the place, and Aijin grabs one of them until he passes out. Aijin drags him to the other bodies. Siukju is amazed by his capabilities and asks about his identity. Aijin replies that he is just a guy from his class. Siukju is stunned and Aijin gets ready to move to the next area. Siepchu looks at him in confusion and disbelief. The scene shifts to Southwest Corp, where Yona's grandfather, the owner of the company, is shown. His assistant informs him that the kidnappers have made their demands. He asks what they want, and the assistant reveals that they demand Southwest Corp terminate the recent contract and respond within an hour, otherwise they will kill Yona. He asks about the security detail, and the assistant informs him that the security team will reach the location in 50 minutes. The old man pinches his hand, and the scene shifts back to the kidnapper's place. A gang member asks another where the guys came from and why they are doing this work. The other tells him that the boss said it's none of their business and that they should focus on the job. He tries to say something, but a rock suddenly hits him, and he passes out. The other one gets confused, notices Aijin dragging the body, and Aijin stares into his eyes and kicks him. Aijin asks Sokju how many guys he has taken out, and Siokju replies that he has taken out five. Aijin calculates that they have taken out 14 of them, indicating they are not short of manpower. Siokju is shocked that Aijin took out nine while he only managed five. Aijin asks Sokju to tell him about the person behind this. Siokju is stunned and explains that they don't know. These things happen occasionally. He recounts a similar case when they were in America and never thought it would happen again so soon, blaming himself. Aijin deduces that the mastermind must be with Yona and explains that this was a plan to kidnap the granddaughter of Southwest Corp. And these guys are just hired hands, incapable of orchestrating something like this. Siepshu is surprised at how far Aijin examined the situation in the midst of combat. Aijin asks if Siepshu will be alright, and Siepshu is puzzled. Aijin points out that Siukju was wounded badly when the van ran them over. Siukju tells Aijin to worry about himself since he is the one with an injured leg. Aijin looks at him, and suddenly other guards come from the other side, not finding any of their comrades. One suggests they might have gone to relieve themselves, but the other questions why the whole group would go. They notice the bodies and Aijin ambushes them, kicking one in the face. Before the other can react, Aijin grabs him and neutralizes him. Aijin tells Sukju they should move separately now since the others would have heard the noise. Before they separate, Sukju tells Ijin he will apologize once they are done with this. The leader hears the noise and tells the others to check it out. Aijin encounters more guards on his way. They are stunned to see he is just a kid, and one of them says that he has seen the picture of Sukju Ko and tells them that he is not Sukju Ko. They ask what he is doing there, and Aijin says these are the real guys running the operation. They tell him it's his bad luck to end up there and prepared to beat him. Meanwhile, Sukju successfully enters the building, hides behind some crates, and finds Yona and Dayun. He notices the coast is clear, thinking everyone went outside to check. Sukju quickly approaches them and removes Yona's mask. Yona asks if the security team has arrived, and he replies they are on their way. Yona then asks how he found them so quickly. Suddenly, the leader returns and identifies Siokchu as the famous Siokchu Ko from Southwest Corp. He mentions that Siokchu is a persistent problem around Yona, always getting in their way. He acknowledges Siokchu's impressive ability to find them so quickly, but criticizes his decision to come alone without the security team. One of the leader's men starts attacking Siokchu, and an intense fight ensues. They both attack and dodge each other's strikes. Siokchu realizes a Jin was right. This man is different from those they fought outside. Siuksha finds an opening, punches him in the solar plexus, follows it with a kick, and then knee kicks him in the back, grabbing the guy. The leader acknowledges Sukju's exceptional skills, 
but warns that this isn't a normal sparing match. Suddenly, a knife slashes Seokju, and blood starts flowing out. The guy attacks him again and again, and Seokju tries his best to dodge, but gets badly cut. He cannot move his body because the first slash was very deep, making it harder to move. The leader mocks Seokju's surprise, asking if he expected them to fight without weapons. He tells him that this is not a sparing match and reveals this is why dealing with people like Seokju is easy. He instructs his man to finish quickly as they need to change locations before the security team arrives. Seokju tries to dodge the knife, but gets badly cut. Immobilized by the first strike, which was particularly lethal, Seokju struggles to move. The boss readies his knife and decides to take care of the other girl before leaving. Seokju, unable to help, watches in horror as the boss approaches Dayeon, who shivers in fear. The boss grins, but Yona steps in front of her. Before the knife can hit Yona, Seokju intervenes and gets stabbed instead. He falls to his knees, screaming in pain, and Yona yells his name. The boss sighs, calling Seokju a pitiful bastard with a fancy reputation, and orders his man to lead Yona alive but finish the other two. The boss smiles as they hear the door open. Aijin stands at the entrance, covered in blood, with bodies lying round outside. Aijin enters the building. In the dimly lit club, Cha's bodyguard informs him that the Gosong cartel is behind the kidnapping. Cha, lighting a cigarette, reflects on the Gozong men's unwavering obedience. They never question their clients and simply carry out their tasks. The bodyguard wonders why he is aiding Aijin in finding his sister, especially since he has been a constant obstacle and has released damaging information about Congressman Kim that Cha has been safeguarding for years. He sighs, feeling the weight of his age. He couldn't match Aijin's strength. Besides, he had been the one to provoke him in the first place, but the bodyguard still wonders why he needs to help him. He could have just ignored him. Smiling wryly, he comes up with the excuse that he feels bad for his sister. Elsewhere, Aijin opens the door to the dark room, immediately drawing everyone's attention. The man asks him who he is. Iona stares at him, bewildered, while Dayan cries out, calling him brother. The kidnapper laughs at the mention of brother, mockingly suggesting that Aijin has come to rescue his kidnapped sister, finding the notion amusing. Ignoring him, Aijin focuses on Dayan and asks if she is all right. She immediately tells him to run away and save himself. Seeing this, Yona feels a surge of guilt. She realizes that because of her, two innocent people have been put at risk. She shouts at the kidnapper, offering herself as his target and promising to cooperate if he lets the others go. However, the kidnapper isn't in any mood to negotiate. Seokju, trembling in pain, looks at Aijin in shock. He notes how even in such a dire situation, he remains unfazed. The masked man, growing impatient, instructs his subordinate to kill a jin. Following his boss's order, the man attacks him with a knife. However, Aijin easily dodges the attack and swiftly turns the knife against him, stabbing him in the shoulder. His quick and decisive action stuns everyone in the room. Turning to Dayeon, he tells her to close her eyes. She quickly follows her brother's request. With a powerful strike, he targets the man's limbs. This causes him to collapse to the ground, screaming in pain. Yona watches in confusion, unable to process what has just happened. Seokju, however, recognizes Aijin's precise movements, realizing that he didn't merely swing the knife wildly. He targeted specific muscles and ligaments to incapacitate the attacker effectively. The kidnapper is taken aback and mentions how Aijin looks more like Dayan's bodyguard than her brother. As he steps closer, the kidnapper remains puzzled, questioning how a boy his age could wield a knife with such skill. He notes the cold, determined look in his eyes, suggesting he is more than just a typical bodyguard. Pulling out his own dagger, the kidnapper declares his intention to kill him regardless of who he is. Moving swiftly, the kidnapper lunges at Aijin, but he manages to dodge the attack. The kidnapper tries to attack again, but Aijin blocks it and tries to counterattack. Reacting quickly, the kidnapper jumps back. They go at it again, but Aijin outclasses him once more, cutting up his arm. Shocked by his skills, the kidnapper demands to know who he is. They both grip their knives, prepared to strike. With a swift motion, the kidnapper attempts to attack, but Aijin seizes his arm, inflicting a precise blow that causes him to scream in pain. Yona is shocked to see this, unable to believe what she is witnessing. Furious, the kidnapper reaches for his gun. Just as he is about to fire, Aijin takes quick action. He throws his knife, stabbing the kidnapper's shoulder with deadly accuracy. He moves in closer, delivering a powerful punch. The man is sent crashing to the ground, ending the fight. 
Siupchu and Yona stare at him in shock. As he turns towards them, it causes them to tremble in fear. He goes over to Dayen and tells her she can now open her eyes. He smiles, assuring her that he's here to take her home. She becomes concerned, noticing the blood on his head. With worry in her voice, she asks if he is okay. With a smile, he assures her that he's alright. Dayon is overcome with emotions and begins to cry, tears streaming down her cheeks. Worried, he asks her why she's crying. Meanwhile, Yona watches them both in disbelief, struggling to comprehend the scene unfolding before her. That makes her realize that perhaps she was wrong about him. The scene shifts to the Southwest Seoul Medical Center. Aijin sits on a bench outside a hospital room, quietly checking his phone. A notification from Jae Dion catches his attention. He asks him where he is. He scrolls through the group chat. They tell him to come on over so they can play again. Seeing this makes him smile, but for now he has other things to deal with. He gazes towards the psychiatry department, reflecting on the events that just unfolded. After he defeated the kidnappers, the police arrived at the crime scene and apprehended all of them. Yona approached him and requested that he take her to the hospital, explaining that she would handle everything there. She explains that Dayan might have internal injuries. She also knows that Dayan was being bullied by Jisoo and Hujin. She acknowledges that they got what they deserved, but that doesn't necessarily free the victim from the lasting trauma. In the present, Ejin ponders Yona's words. Suddenly, the door opens and Dayan comes out. Eager to know how it went, he asks her what the doctor said. She reassures him that she's perfectly fine, but the doctor wants her to come weakly. Other than a few bruises, Aijin is also fine. She sighs in relief, expressing her happiness that he's okay. As he looks at her, he recalls her tear-streaked face from earlier, pleading for him to leave. Dayan also recalls something but hesitates to ask. It's something she overheard from the policemen. They were shocked to see that a boy his age managed to take out all the kidnappers. Hearing this made a few questions come to her mind, like how he is able to fight so well or what kind of life he lived before coming to Korea. While she wrestles with her thoughts, Yona approaches and calls her name, asking how she's doing. She replies that things are settling down and thanks her for arranging free treatment for her. However, Yona assures that this is the least she can do. After all, it was because of her that the two of them got into that mess in the first place. She offers a heartfelt apology for all the trouble. Dayan insists that she doesn't need to apologize, noting that she is also a victim. Meanwhile, Aijin and Yona's bodyguard exchange glances. Yona then turns her attention to him, asking if he underwent a checkup too. Dayun interjects, revealing that he initially refused but she threatened not to get treatment unless he did. She then queries Yon about Seokju's whereabouts, wondering if he's also in the hospital. Upon learning Seokju's location, she suggests they visit him as well. They find him in his room, where she apologizes for not thanking him earlier. Seokju, puzzled, reassures her that it's fine. While their conversation continues, Aijin notices Yona staring at him, her eyes still showing fear. Dayun bows again, expressing her hope for his speedy recovery. With that, the two of them depart. The bodyguard questions Silkshu about Aijin, asking if he was with them during the ordeal. The bodyguard is left shocked at how such a scrawny young boy managed to neutralize so many men. Yona admits that she was amazed herself, but she is shocked to see how it's surprising even to an expert like him. He explains that it isn't simply about the boy beating up a group of men. He neutralized over 10 well-trained guards, this feat is exceedingly challenging even for seasoned professionals. What's more impressive is that he incapacitated them without causing any fatalities. Judging from the cuts on those men, his knife skills are far beyond anything ordinary. Moreover, those were not ordinary thugs but retired soldiers. Considering all this, he deduces that Aijin is a highly trained professional with substantial combat experience. His analysis leaves Yona and Sukju both worried and astonished. As Aijin and Dayeon walk side by side along the road, she thanks him, expressing regret for not having done so the day before. She smiles, remarking that she finds herself thanking him quite often lately, given how much she relies on his help. He smiles back, suggesting that he should be the one thanking her. This response leads her puzzled. He explains that it's the first time someone put his safety before their own. He had never experienced that before coming to Korea. Looking at her face, he acknowledges that having a family makes him feel happy. Elsewhere, the guard informs Jai about the kidnapping. She is astounded that Sikju tracked the culprit so swiftly and subdued them even before the security team arrived. She surmises that he is truly exceptional and realizes she has lost count of how many times he has saved Yona. She feels frustrated, believing that she should have been the one with a gifted child like him, not Yona. 
she sees it as a waste of talent. The guard also mentions a circulating rumor. When she inquires about it, he reveals that although Sukju was instrumental in the rescue, there were traces of another student who accompanied him and proved to be even more extraordinary. She is baffled, wondering how this is possible. She is even more shocked to learn that the chairman of the company has taken an interest in this classmate. She is now convinced that the rumor is true. The scene shifts back to Aijin's room, where he is doing his daily pull-ups. He recalls how he stabbed the guy and knocked him out. Suddenly, there is a knock on the door. It's Dayeon who tells him to come out and eat something. He exits his room and notices her at the table, eating fruit. He asks how she is feeling. She responds that he has already asked her this and that she is fine and doing well. She tells him that he doesn't need to worry about other things either. She knows he is concerned about what she has seen him do and how curious she might be about his exceptional fighting skills. He is speechless, but she reassures him that it won't change how she views him. He did what he had to in order to save her, so she won't bother him by asking about his past life. Dayan continues, saying she couldn't tell Grandpa about the bad things that happened to her in school, and she couldn't even tell him. She smiles and remarks that it seems some things are simply unspeakable. Suddenly, her phone rings, interrupting their conversation. She answers the call, and on the other end, it's Yona. She assures her that she is fine and there is nothing to worry about. Yona then inquires about Aijin. The scene shifts to the convenience store. Smiling, Yona asks Aijin to sit down. He questions why she wanted to see him, and she reveals that she wanted to apologize for putting her sister in a dangerous situation. He reminds her that she already apologized for it. She explains that she wanted to apologize to him separately, and that Silkshu had said he would come to apologize to him in person once he gets better. She also wanted to thank him for saving her. Agent clarifies that he went to save Dayan, not her. Yona, flustered, acknowledges this, but insists that she still received a lot of help from him. He asks if this is the reason she called him out. She informs him that they will stop investigating his background. He stares at her, and she urges him not to be angry. She explains that they couldn't ignore the fact that Aijin's documents were all forged. She had just experienced a kidnap attempt in America, and then they met him, which raised some suspicion. She shares that she has been in many bad situations since childhood because of her identity. She explains that while they never discovered why his documents were forged, they will drop the investigation. She knows he wouldn't have come to save Dayun if he had any intention of harming her. He stands up and tells her he is leaving as she is finished talking. Yeon asks him to wait and inquires if he can spare a couple of hours. She mentions that her grandpa wants to meet him and thank him in person. He declines, stating he didn't come to rescue her in the first place. He turns around and leaves, and she sits there, staring at his back, unsure of what to say. As the sun sets, he heads home when he notices a member of Dushik Cha's gang in a worse state. Recognizing him, he says that he is from Dushik's gang. The gang member curses him, blaming him for the current situation. He explains that things were already bad enough for his boss after the stunt with Congressman Kim, but then Dushik Cha stirred up trouble with the Gojon cartel just to help him. The scene shifts to Dushik Cha's club, where all his men have been defeated, and he is surrounded by Gojon cartel members. Their boss tells him to surrender before he makes a fool of himself in front of the others. He retorts that the boss shouldn't be talking because he knew he had given his boys a weekend off, yet still brought the Song Su crew along. The leader of the other gang chides him for tampering with the congressman and playing tricks on Gojon's men recently. He smiles and retorts that he just helped Gojon realize he is nothing more than a dog who shouldn't bite the hand that feeds him. Infuriated by being called a dog, Gojon orders his men to attack. The men charge at him, who takes them on and knocks them out one by one. Goshen Choi grows frustrated as Cha effortlessly dispatches the attackers. One of his men strikes him from behind with a bat, causing him to lose his balance. Quickly recovering, he takes care of the assailant. Glancing at the remaining men, he feels overwhelmed and questions why Gojong Choi brought so many when he knew he was alone. He clenches his fists, acknowledging this as the end, and smiles, wondering if Ejin managed to save his sister. Outside, Aijin reaches the club, and a gangster tells him to leave. He ignores him and kicks him in the face. The others are shocked as he dismounts his motorbike. Aijin approaches, and the gangster, in anger, tries to punch him, but he is no match for him. Before the other one can react, he kicks him in the stomach and bashes his head on his knee, entering the club with a cold aura. He moves in and sees the bodies of gangsters. Some other guys notice him and tell him to get out. Aijin ignores them, prompting one to curse and repeat his demand. He approaches, and the guy, 
thinking he has lost his senses, questions if he didn't hear him. Before he can finish his sentence, Ijin smacks him, causing him to pass out. The other guy looks at him in confusion, and they tell each other to attack. Ijin jabs the guy with the bat, grabs the other guy's punch, and jabs him as well. Another swings his bat, but Ijin swiftly dodges it, breaks his knee bone, and as he falls to his knees, finishes him off with a knee kick to the face. The last one, frightened, tries to run but cannot outrun him, who punches him, causing him to pass out. Meanwhile, Cha has exhausted all his strength. Go Shong is frustrated because he never thought he would last this long. He realizes he would have been trouble in the future, and that their plan would have failed if he hadn't been alone. He thinks it's fortunate that he had no ambition of stirring trouble with them until now. The remaining men rush at Cha. He takes one down, but, exhausted, starts to get overwhelmed. Goshong tells him he is an impressive fighter, but at the end of his rope, urging him to give up, promising to make it worth his while. He spits blood and retorts that he would never obey orders from a coward, then challenges them to finish it. The men look at him in confusion. Suddenly, there is the sound of glass shattering and someone being beaten. They are unsure of what is happening outside and see a shadow entering the room. It's none other than Ai-jin. The guys ask each other where this kid came from. Chen notices him and asks what he is doing here. Ai-jin responds that he came to return his motorcycle. He is stunned and cannot fathom what he is talking about at a time like this. The leader of the Song Su crew sneers, noting that Chan knows this kid and orders his men to take him down too. The men approach, and Cho warns them that if he were them, he would leave Ajin alone. The leader insists they cannot let him go since he knows Cha and has seen everything. He laughs, cursing, and says it's not for him to decide if Ajin will let them go and spare their lives. He suddenly watches as Ijin destroys the gangsters one by one. He kicks one guy, and another launches an attack from behind. He grabs his hand, punches him, and he passes out. Gojong is shocked, and Cher reminds him of his warning, revealing that even he, though reluctant to admit it, is no match for Ijin. In a frightened state, Gojong Choi orders his men to kill him. They all charge at him, but once again, the result is the same as he defeats them one by one. Gojong curses his men telling them not to be beaten by a kid. Suddenly, Che reaches Gojong, who is shocked, and he questions if he forgot about him. After some time, the other gangs have been defeated. Che slumps, catching his breath. He looks at Ai-jin and all the men he has defeated, calling him a monster. He informs Cha that he has repaid his favor. He, stunned, understands that Ai-jin came here to settle his debt. He asks about Ai-jin's sister, and he tells him that he saved her in time, thanks to him, and then turns around to leave. The scene transitions to the hospital. Young Su wakes, calling for his boss. He breathes heavily, then notices Cha and asks if it is really him. He tells him to stop yelling. Young Su can't believe it, and Cha explains that he was in bad condition, so he took a taxi and came here for treatment. Young Su asks what happened to the Gojong and Song Su gangs if he is here. He tells him he took care of them. Young Su does not believe him, and he asks why he would lie about it. He comments that maybe Cha is just ashamed that he lost to them. He gets angry and asks if he thinks they would have let him walk back in one piece. He sighs and says that he heard Yang Su went to meet Ai Jin and gave him a hard time. He asks if he is talking about the high school kid. He explains that he lost his cool after being jumped by the gangs and wasn't thinking straight, so he attacked Ai Jin. He continues, informing Cha that he doesn't know what happened after taking the first hit from him. Cha says that he Ijin probably knocked Young Su out to rush him to a hospital for treatment. He explains that the gangsters kept coming, and he was ready to give up, but then Ijin showed up. The situation changed quickly, and he wiped them all out in a matter of seconds. He then told him that he had paid his debt and left the scene. Young Su is stunned and says that's cool. He tells him he was thinking the same at that time. Young Su is curious about his identity and asks if he knows who he really is. Che reveals that Ijin claims to be a normal teenager and that they should believe it and stop peeking into his background. The scene shifts back to the school ground. Ijin mistakenly grabs the football with his hands and the referee gives a foul. Young Chan is shocked and Jae Neon tells him that he is not supposed to grab it because he is not a goalkeeper. He apologizes, saying he didn't mean to. After the match, Hyuk Shin asks if she has time for a game today and Jae Neon tries to convince him because today is the only day that Yeon Chen doesn't have classes after school. Ijin tells him to go ahead, and he will meet them there after he has walked his sister home. They are confused, 
and he informs them that she is not feeling well these days. Hayekshin tells him that they will be waiting for him. In Dayan's class, she is thinking about what they will have for dinner today. She wonders if she should make kimchi stew because Aijin loved it last time. But she doesn't think that he is good with spicy food. She thinks of making something less spicy like soybean paste stew instead. Suddenly, the girls in her class notice Aijin and start talking about him. One girl questions Dayan if Aijin is dating someone. Dayan is puzzled and tells her that he said he wasn't dating anyone. The girl then vanishes. Dayan heads out and guesses that Aijin is really popular because she hears the girls in her class talking about him, and Yona also asks her twice if he has a girlfriend. Dayan wonders why he doesn't have a girlfriend and questions if he is not interested, betting that a lot of girls would want to date him. She notices him and his friends and greets them. They quickly leave, telling him to walk her home quickly and then hurry to the game room. Dayan questions if he is going to hang out with his friends. Aijin replies that he is, but he will stop at home first. She questions if it is because of her. He replies that he has left something at home. She informs him that she will be fine on her own as it is still very bright. He tells her that he really has something that he left at home. She explains that he doesn't have to do that from now on, and she also told Yona the same thing when she offered to have her security escort her for a while. All she wants is to live a normal life. Aijin looks at her and says that he will do as she says, but that they should walk like this from time to time. Dayan tells him that he is just worrying himself a lot. He explains that he is not worried and that the reason is that he enjoys their walks together. Dayan understands and Jai and her guard appear out of nowhere. She greets him and Aijin looks at her while Dayan wonders who she is. Jai looks at her and tells her that she must be the one who suffered through all this because of Yona. She questions who she is and Jai reveals that she is Yona's cousin. She explains that she wanted to thank Aijin for saving Yona and wants to treat him to dinner if he can spare the time. He rejects her offer with a straight face and reveals that Yona already thanked him, so there is no need for her to go out of her way. Jai gets flustered and informs him that she also has a proposition that she would like to discuss with him. He ignores her, passes her, and says that he is not interested. She gets humiliated by him, and in anger she asks who he thinks he is. The guard asks her if he should bring him back. She tells him not to go that far and looks at his back, cursing him for brushing her off. The scene shifts to the game room. Yongchen excuses himself because he needs to use the restroom. In the hall, he accidentally bumps into a guy. The guy, in a scary tone, tells him to watch where he is going and curses him. Yongchen gets frightened and apologizes. The guy gets angry and tries to slap him because he only said sorry after bumping into him. Suddenly, Jin Yong appears and intervenes. He tells him to stop because Yangshin accidentally bumped into his shoulder. He approaches the guy and spits out his lollipop. Jade Yang stares into his eyes and questions if he takes them for pushovers. The guy gets frightened. As Jade Yang approaches the man, he notices the anger building in him. He aggravates him further, hurling insults. But the man remains silent, seething with anger as he continues on his way. He sighs in frustration, then shifts his attention to Yang Chan, urging him to leave before Hyukshin causes more trouble. As they walk away, Yang Chan looks at Jae Hyun, wondering why he helped him without any apparent reason. As they enter the gaming room, Hyukshin shouts at them, demanding to know why they took so long, as if they were taking a dump. He responds, explaining that some punks were messing with Yang Chan. Hyukshin, concerned, asks who they were. He mentions that they were wearing Gozak technical uniforms. Hyukshin immediately approaches Yang Chan, asking if he's okay. He reassured him, saying nothing happened because Jae Deong was there to help. Jae Deong then tells them to stop gossiping and start playing. As they are engrossed in their game, the man who hit Yang Chan approaches the gaming room with a group of people and demands they come with him. Confused, they comply and are led to the back of the school. Yang Chan trembles in fear, believing it's all his fault. The man mocks Jae Deong, suggesting his confidence stems from having another chump with him and threatens that they're going to get beaten nice and easy today. He smirks, taunting the man by pointing out that his confidence only comes from having his buddies around. He then asks if the man was pretending to be scared so they could lure them out of the guard's sight, but laughs, saying the man doesn't seem smart enough to pull off something like that. The man becomes enraged and swings at Jae Hyun, telling him to shut up. He deftly dodges the attack and manages to land a punch on the man's face. Yong Chin stands at the back, freaking out and blaming himself for their predicament, thinking if only he had been more careful they wouldn't be in this mess. Noticing his discomfort, Jae Hyun reassures him, saying they are the ones who should be apologizing, not him. 
His words touch Yongchen deeply, and he is on the verge of tears when Haekshin steps in, pointing out that the line he just used was something Aijin had said, even down to the same tone and mannerisms. Haekshin's comment makes Yongchen laugh, adding that Jane Yong looked good saying it, guessing that he practiced the line a lot. Embarrassed, he replies that he didn't practice at all. The man's anger intensifies due to their conversation, prompting him to attack. Jade Yang and Hyokshin skillfully dodge the assaults and counter with punches. Meanwhile, Yongshin stands back, freaking out and realizing he has never been in a real fight before. As he tries to move forward, Hyokshin shouts at him to stay back, while Jade Yang assures him that although Yongchan might outrank them in the game world, they've gotten covered in this situation. He is shocked, feeling responsible for getting them into this mess and frustrated that they won't let him help. Jae Jiang and Hyukshin manage to knock their attackers to the ground, but the men quickly get back up. He feels disheartened, thinking how Ejin would have knocked them out with a single blow. Lost in his thoughts, he gets kicked in the stomach and is about to be punched when Yongchen intervenes, grabbing the attacker from behind and stopping him. Despite the man's efforts to push him away, he holds on long enough for Jae Dion to recover and beat the man down. As the fight ends, Hyokshin teases Jia Hyang, saying he needed Yong Chan's help to save him. Jia Hyang, annoyed, retorts that he was about to attack, but Yong Chan got in the way and tells him to shut up. He then approaches him, asking if he is okay. Yong Chan smiles, says he is fine, and apologizes for causing trouble. Hyokshin tells him to forget it, reminding him of Jae Dion's words and causing further embarrassment. Meanwhile, Ejin arrives, wondering why no one is answering his calls. Upon seeing his friends, they inform him that he is late and missed the action, boasting about having just beaten up three to six goons. Yongchen then suggests they head inside. As they walked up the stairs, Jae Hyang recounts that they weren't familiar with the Gozhe guys, but they were pretty tough, although not much of a match for them. As they continue, they are stunned to see numerous men nearly unconscious on the ground, recognizing them as students from Gozak Tech and wondering how they ended up there. To their surprise, Aijin casually explains that he encountered them on the way, and they attacked him upon seeing his uniform, so he beat them up. His nonchalant revelation leaves everyone completely shocked, struggling to process what they just heard. Jade Yang is hungry and tells everyone to start eating. Hayekshin asks if this is what he wanted, and he replies that it is. He then mentions that he forgot to get the drinks. Yongchen offers to accompany him, but he insists that he's fine. Hayukshin can't stop thinking about those idiots who tried to take them for chumps and ended up getting beaten. Jae Dion laughs, recalling how they charged and trying to look like gangsters and won't be seen for a while now. Aijin, meanwhile, is confused about how to open the gimbap until he notices Jae Hyang unwrapping it and mimics him. He asks who started the fight, and Jae Nyong reveals that one of those thugs was messing with Yang Chen's game room. Concerned, Aijin asks if he is injured, and it's explained that Jae Yong came to his rescue. He advises Aijin not to back down if he finds himself in a similar situation. Aijin is puzzled, so he elaborates that he should stand his ground, showing that he's ready for anything. Otherwise, those thugs will think he can't fight back and will eat him alive. Aijin adds that Aijin needs to show he's not a pushover, or people will just walk all over him. Yong Chan, worried, asks what if they actually hit him. Jae Dion explains that they'll still hit him if he appears scared, possibly even more. But if he doesn't say anything, he'll be labeled a coward, making things worse. Hayakshin has seen it work. The guys don't want to risk picking on someone who fights back, so they target the weak and quiet ones who don't speak up. He advises Yong Chan to speak up and defend himself. Ajin quietly eats his food, and the scene shifts to his past. He recalls taking his food when a guy demands it. The scene turns red, and the camp people are stunned as Ai Jin stands over the guys on the ground, his hands and face covered in their blood. The guy looks into Ai Jin's eyes, terrified. The scene shifts back to the present, where Yang Chen reveals that he didn't like Jae Hyang and Hayak Chen because they bullied the kids in their class, including him. Jae Hyang asks when they ever bullied someone, insisting they were just joking around. Hayekshin also explains they never hit anyone or made them run errands. Compared to others, they consider themselves saints, especially compared to Gyusa Kim's homeroom, which is a living hell. Yang Chan explains that while they might think they're just playing around, for the rest, it's still violence. Both are stunned as he explains that violence, great or small, is still violence and he hated them for being cruel without guilt. Smiling, he says they advised him to speak up, so he thought he'd give it a try. They are taken back. Hayekshin admits he doesn't know what to say, 
No one has ever confronted him like this. He thought it was just joking and didn't realize people were getting hurt. Jae Young feels the same and thought it was okay because they weren't as rough as others. Young Chin finds it strange how nice they were when they started hanging out, thinking they didn't realize their actions were a form of violence. They never beat up a kid for money or made anyone do their work, and they never hit him that hard. Jae Young and Hyuk Shin both apologize. Hyuk Shin knows a simple apology doesn't a ton for their actions but can't think of anything else to say. While unwrapping the gimbap, it falls from Ijin's hands. He tries to pick it up, but they stop him, insisting he can't eat it off the ground. The scene shifts to the Southwest Court building, where Yona bursts into Jai's office with a guard trying to stop her. Happy to see her, Yona yells at Jai. Jai asks why she's yelling, and Yona demands to know why she's running a background check on Ijin. Jai explains she was the one running the check because he was suspicious. Yona admits he was suspicious, but has stopped and promised him she wouldn't do it again, urging Jai to stop too. Jai questions if Yona realizes the kind of life they lead and if she has forgotten all the horrible things that happened to her. Yona tries to respond, but Jai cuts her off, saying that while he helped and rescued her, it doesn't make him trustworthy. Jai questions if Yona wants her to ignore the fact that a kid with a fake background is in her class. The guard acknowledges Yona's position but emphasizes it's a concern for the school since it means a school affiliated with Southwest Corp accepted a student with fake documents. Yona is stunned. Jai says she's glad Yona is here because they will receive news any minute. Yona is confused and the guard explains that Ijin's records were restricted, so they contacted higher-ups for the records. Jai smiles, asking if Yona isn't curious about his identity. Yona replies she doesn't want to know because he saved her and that's enough. Suddenly, the phone rings and Jai suggests they all listen. She puts the phone on speaker. The caller informs them about her recent inquiry. Jai is excited to learn Ejin's true identity. The caller notes her persistent inquiries about Ejin's identity. She explains it was difficult to find any information. The caller states that orders from above dictate that Southwest Corp should refrain from inquiring about Ejin's identity. Everyone is shocked. Jai insists they don't even know who he really is. The caller reassures them that considering the friendship between the company and the government, Southwest Corp has nothing to worry about regarding Ai Jin. He explains that Ai Jin was estranged from his family after a plane crash and is just a young man who has found his way back home. The scene shifts to the school where Yona and Sipchu enter the class. Hayek Jin notices them and comments that he hasn't seen them in school for a while. Jae Yong is stunned because they are entering when the class is practically over. She glances at them, and Yang Chen wonders why she is staring at him. She asks if Ai Jin is not at school today. He reveals that Ai Jin was there earlier, but he doesn't know where he went. Jae Yong adds that Ai Jin was called to the office a few minutes ago. They both sit in their seats. Siuk Chu informs her that the chairman is at school right now. She is puzzled and wonders why her grandpa is there, thinking he might have come to meet Ai Jin. The chairman explains that he wanted to meet Aijin in person and thank him, but since Aijin declined, he came to express his gratitude for saving his granddaughter. Aijin replies that there is no need to thank him because he was only trying to save his sister, and Yona just happened to be there too. The chairman acknowledges this but insists that Aijin still saved his granddaughter nonetheless. He also apologizes for getting Aijin's sister involved in the matter. Aijin replies that he doesn't need to worry about it because Yona had already apologized to him. Aijin states that if that is all the chairman wanted to say, he will take his leave and turns around to go. The old man asks if Aijin will be Yona's bodyguard. Aijin reveals that it's not something an average teenager like him could do. The old man informs him that a normal teenager cannot neutralize a unit of former special soldiers. Aijin asks why Southwest Corp needs him when they have their own security. The chairman replies that they cannot protect her at school. He explains that the circumstances are different for an old man like him, but for a young girl like Yona, she won't be able to lead a normal life with a security team following her around. Seopshu also asked to be relieved of her security detail a few days ago because the incident convinced him that he is not qualified, which is why the chairman thought of Aijin. Aijin responds that he doesn't think he can help in this case. As he tries to leave, the old man says he is not just here to thank Aijin for saving Yona, but also for what he did three years ago. Ejin is shocked and turns around. The chairman continues, saying that he has been waiting to express his gratitude for some time now. Without Ejin's efforts, he wouldn't have been able to see his son before he passed away. Ejin replies that it was just another job for him. 
The chairman acknowledges that it was a dangerous job and no one else wanted to accept it. Aijin was the only one who accepted and completed the mission successfully, allowing the chairman to see his son again. He adds that his son often spoke about Aijin and wanted him to find out why Aijin was working as a mercenary, but it was impossible to locate him. The chairman reveals that Yona is his daughter. Aijin remembers that the man told him he had a daughter about his age. He thinks and tells the chairman that he cannot guard her but also won't look the other way if something happens to her. The old man is happy to hear this and asks one more request. He wants to hear Aijin's thoughts on their security team at Southwest Court. Ajin asks what he means, and the chairman explains that Southwest security is part of a long and proud tradition, perhaps too proud for its own good. They believe Yona's recent kidnapping would have been contained without Ajin's help. He continues that Southwest is growing its business, and as threats increase, their security team is lacking innovation. For this reason, he would like Ajin to test their skills, and he would be paid for it. Ajin sighs and returns to his class. Yona waves at him, but he ignores her and the teacher starts teaching. He thinks about his conversation, guessing that the man he saved has died. The scene shifts to the past, where Aijin is guarding some people. He takes out a protein bar to eat. A man interrupts him, asking why a young kid like him is working as a mercenary. The man never saw his face and never thought he was that young. He questions if Aijin is a teenager, and Aijin covers his face. The man tells him to stop eating the bar and gives him some food to try. Aijin looks at him, and the man says that what he eats really matters at his age. The other mercenaries talk about the rich client, saying they are building roads, clinics, and a school in the town they are taking them to. One of them comments that it's a waste to invest in that town, but others argue they are just going to help. One of them says it's pointless, guessing the townspeople hit a jackpot. Another suggests that if the client is rich enough to invest in a useless town, they should give them some money. Aijin stays at his position, and the man approaches him again, giving him a chocolate bar. Sometimes he gives Ijin food and brings him an umbrella in the rain. Time passes and Ijin is leaving for a new job. The man says he will miss him and tells him to stop by if he has time since they will be there for another month. He tosses Ijin a bag full of food and medical supplies. Ijin questions why he is giving this to him. The man is stunned because Ijin spoke in Korean and he never thought he knew Korean. He says Ijin should have told him this earlier. The man tried to talk to him in various languages, but Aijin never responded. Aijin looks at him, and the man asks if he really wants to know why he is getting these supplies. He reveals that he has a daughter the same age as Aijin, and Aijin reminds him of her, which worries him. On Aijin's next mission, his partner tells him the news that the town where his clients were has been taken over by a resistance group. The partner reveals that they were waiting for the buildings to be finished before taking over the area, and most of the people there were killed. The scene transitions back to the present and Yeon approaches a Jin, asking if he is free. At the lounge, Seokju apologizes for doubting him and for the late apology, but he wanted to apologize in person. Aijin tells him there is no need for it, he understands Seokju's reasons and that he did what he had to do. Yeon hesitates and tells Ijin that her grandpa asked her to invite him on his behalf, although she knows Aijin will not go. Surprisingly, Aijin agrees to go, shocking her. The scene shifts to Jai, who is furious and questioning who Aijin really is and why the government is not revealing his identity. Her guard informs her that Aijin is here to see her, leaving her puzzled. The scene shifts to Southwest Corp's men's locker room. Aijin is changing, his clothes, and Siopchu asks how this came to be. The chairman instructed Aijin to spend a few days with his men and share his thoughts. He explains that arrangements have been made to accommodate him, making it easy for him to get a sense of their program. Aijin informs Seokju that he expressed a desire to experience what being in a security team is like. Seokju wonders if Aijin wants to become a bodyguard. Aijin asks if Seokju is not going to join the training. Seokju reveals that today's session is for Team 2, and he is part of Team 3. He explains that his team escorts only Yona, while Team 2 escorts Jai and her parents. In the training room, the coach informs the team that Aijin will be joining them in training for the next few days. He mentions that Aijin is in the same class as Seokju, and the chairman has allowed him to participate in their training program to learn about their field. One of the team members questions if Aijin is the same person who helped Seokju during the kidnapping situation, and Seokju confirms it. They are stunned, and Aijin introduces himself, thanking them for allowing him to participate. Yeon asks if he wanted to see what it's like being a bodyguard. Seokju replies that this is what Aijin said, 
and Yona had no idea about it. She guesses that it would suit him and notices Jai, wondering what she is doing there. The team is doing a stamina drill, and one of the members notices that Aijin is keeping up with them and tells the guards to speed up and stay in formation. They follow his orders, and the session ends with everyone catching their breath. He looks at Aijin, noting that they ran enough to make him faint, but he still kept up and seems capable of running 20 more laps. He tells them to do five more and climb the rope. Yona is amazed that the security team cannot keep up with him. Siuksu comments that it's because Aijin is a monster. Jai remarks that it's basic training, but Team 2 is falling behind Aijin. One of them questions where they found this kid and wonders if he has already trained somewhere because he is exceptionally skilled. He looks at the guard standing beside Jai, who becomes frightened because he anticipates being scolded. One of the guards raises his hand and mentions that he heard Aijin played an important role in Yona's rescue and would like to test his abilities. The leader is shocked and asks if he expects him to let him spar with the high school kid, questioning what is wrong with him. Suddenly, Jai approaches and Yona is stunned. Aijin says he doesn't mind. The leader scratches his head in frustration and tells them to get the protective gear on Aijin. They both put on the protective gear. Yona is worried and asks if it's fine. Siexu cannot say anything because the security team is also strong. Another guard says that most of the guards are from special forces and wonders how long Aijin will last. Jai asks if the guy won't lose to some teenager, and the guard tells her that Aijin is extraordinary, as if he is a trained professional. He assures her that Aijin is no match for their men because they are highly skilled in all types of combat before they even began working at Southwest Corp. The leader tells them both to go easy and warns his men not to push Aijin hard. The guy reassures him. He then tells Ijin that he is nothing like the thugs he faced before, and the leader signals to start the fight. The guy approaches and punches Ijin, who swiftly dodges it. He throws another punch, and Yona is worried because the guard is not supposed to go that hard in a sparing match. He punches again, and Ijin dodges, kicking his leg and staggering him. Ijin throws a punch, and the guard blocks it, asking if Ijin thought he got him. He tries to punch Ajin again, but Ajin counterattacks and punches him in the face. Yona is stunned, and the guard is surprised because Ajin precisely attacked the exposed area of his face. The guard goes down on his knees, and Ajin kicks his face using a knee kick. Blood spills out, and the guy falls to the ground. Ajin removes his helmet. The other guards and their leader are shocked that Ajin defeated their member. Siokchi remarks that Ajin doesn't know how to take things easy and questions how it was a sparing match. Yona is shocked, and her guards think that maybe it was intentional all along. Jai is amazed and seriously questions if he is really 19 years old. Her guard is furious because his team was defeated by a kid. They take the knocked out guard for treatment. The leader is shocked because Ejin is not on the same level as them, explaining why he had a bigger role in saving Yona than Sukju. Jai's guard stares at him, knowing he is done for. Another guard expresses his desire to fight Ejin. The leader asks if he has lost his mind, considering they have already lost once to Aijin. The guard explains that after seeing Aijin's skills, he wants to test him too. The leader insists they can't all fight a teenager. Aijin states that he doesn't mind. The guard asks if he is serious, considering he must be tired. Aijin replies that he hasn't moved around enough to get tired. They get chills and see if size. Vyom Suk enters the ring and asks Ijin where he learned to fight like that. Ijin questions why Vyom Suk is not wearing headgear. Vyom Suk replies that he doesn't need it but can use one if Ijin needs it. Ijin also throws his helmet away. Vyom Suk is puzzled, calls him a punk, and says he likes his spirit. Jai asks what will happen, and her guard explains that they made the mistake of underestimating their opponent, but it won't happen again. He asserts that their men train every day and this time Aijin is up against their ace. Yona's guard says it might be different if weapons were involved, but hand-to-hand -hand combat depends on physical strength, and Biam Sok Choi is a difficult opponent. He acknowledges that no matter what kind of training Aijin has gone through, nothing could have prepared him for this fight. They start fighting, and Biam Sok attacks while Aijin counterattacks and blocks it. Biam Sok attacks again, and Aijin dodges it and punches him, but Biam Sok blocks it. He tells Ajin that he is stronger than he looks. Ajin punches again, and Bion Sok blocks it. Yona is worried, and Bion Sok tells Ajin that he won't break his guard with petty tricks. Ajin kicks his knee, staggering him. The guards are stunned. Bion Sok loses his balance, curses Ajin, and tries to land a blow. 
Aijin punches him and lands a series of punches. Byung Suk throws another punch, but Aijin changes its trajectory and punches him again, causing him to fall to his knees. Both Yona and Jai are surprised as Byung Suk starts coughing. Yona's guard is stunned because Aijin broke Byung Suk's upper guard by striking his knees and quickly struck his neck, which is enough to narrow the gap in physical strength between them. Further attacks on his vitals would disable his advantages entirely. Ijin asks if anyone else wants to fight, and they are too shocked to speak. The leader tells Ijin that he shouldn't go for the neck or knees when sparing with someone. Ijin asks if there are rules for sparing and apologizes because he wasn't aware of them. He tries to explain, but it looks like they are just trying to pick on him because their team was defeated. Jai guesses that it wasn't really a coincidence that Ijin and Seokju saved Yona. She asks her guard for his opinion, and he tells her that every aspect of Aijin they have witnessed is exceptional. She smiles and tells him they should move to the next course. Yona is confused and wonders what she means. Jai asks Ajin if he wants to experience real duties since he is done with basic training. Now it's time to see what it feels like to be a real bodyguard. She looks at Aijin with a smile and tells him he is pairing with Team 2, which means he will be escorting her. The chairman and his assistant are looking at them through the camera. The assistant never imagined that Aijin would be in the same class as Yona. This also shocks the chairman. The assistant explains that he learned about Aijin during their research, but it is still shocking to see firsthand that the mercenary whose code name was Jin is none other than Aijin. His name was only revealed a few years ago, which means he was even younger when he became known for his talent. The assistant cannot believe that a kid like him is the same ruthless mercenary. The scene shifts to the locker room and Aijin gets ready for duty. As night falls, Dayeon is preparing dinner when her grandpa inquires about Aijin, who hasn't returned home yet. She reassures him that Dayeon will be late due to some tasks. Her grandpa sighs with concern, fearing the dangers of the night, especially the possibility of encountering hooligans. Cut to a tense scene elsewhere. A group of guards sit in silence, their expressions miserable. Their leader is furiously berating them, calling them a disgrace to their profession. His anger is intense as he warns them that after their latest failure, things will get even tougher. The air is thick with fear, making the guards visibly anxious. As the leader storms out, his second-in-command stands, relieved they avoided harsher punishment this time. On the balcony above, Yona and her guard watch the scene below with intrigue. Suddenly, Ajin arrives with Jai and her three bodyguards. The guards kneel, glaring at Aijin, who remains unfazed. After a brief moment, they exit the southwest building. Jai steps into her car, surrounded by a convoy of guards and vehicles, which confuses Aijin. The leader instructs Aijin to sit in the backseat with Jai, and he complies. As they settle in, Aijin can't help but notice the unusual security setup. Two guards always by Jai's side, and three in the trailing car. Lost in thought, he's jolted back to reality when Jai asks if he's ever considered a career in singing or acting. Startled, Aijin looks at her in confusion. Jai explains that one of her Southwest subsidiaries is an entertainment agency, and they're heading there now. Aijin, still perplexed, responds that he's never been interested in such a career. Jai ponders his response as they continue their journey, leaving us to wonder what lies ahead for Aijin in this unexpected turn of events. Jai looked at him, a slay smile playing on her lips, as she asked why he wouldn't be a suitable candidate for the profession. She then smirked and questioned if he had any interest in becoming a bodyguard. Concerned about maintaining his image in front of them, Aijin reluctantly agreed. Jai's smile widened, confident that he would make an excellent bodyguard after witnessing his performance today, especially how effortlessly he defeated the guards in Team 2. Her words made the blood of the leader sitting in front of them boil. Aijin, however, explained modestly that he only managed to prevail because the guards in Team 2 had underestimated him, assuming he was just an inexperienced kid. He added that he had started with a significant advantage and had the guards considered him a real threat and given their best effort, he wouldn't have defeated them. Jai smirked, knowing he was downplaying his abilities. She had expected him to boast about beating professional bodyguards, but he wasn't that type at all. The leader, on the other hand, was furious, believing Ajin had astutely analyzed the situation, drawing a perfect assessment of their missteps. In the quiet of her office, Jai works diligently while Aijin and the leader stand guard. The leader seethes with frustration, noting how, despite standing for hours, he is exhausted while Aijin remains as fresh as a rose. Unable to contain his curiosity, the leader questions Aijin about the intensity of his training. 
Aijin's calm demeanor only intensifies the leader's irritation. He points out that the tactics Aijin employs during training and sparring can't be mastered without rigorous and consistent practice. Aijin, with a serene expression, reveals that his training comes from the harsh streets where he grew up. This admission leaves the leader perplexed. He has never pegged Aijin as a street brawler, but now Aijin seems like a mystery he can't unravel. Memories flood back to Aijin, recalling battles fought with all his might on the streets just to survive and catch a glimpse of hope. As Jai wraps up her work, and they settle into the car for the journey home, she glances at Aijin and asks if he is alright after such a grueling day. Aijin's nonchalant affirmation puzzles her, prompting her to question if it is truly his first day as a bodyguard. His composed response, bowing slightly, is a simple denial, leaving Jai even more baffled. The leader, observing this exchange, finds Aijin's behavior increasingly odd. It is unsurprising that Jai is left with such an impression. Aijin has remained silent throughout the journey, showing no signs of fatigue or hunger, even though they have deliberately skipped dinner to test him. It is as if Aijin instinctively knows these situations could arise while on security duty, maintaining his unwavering position until instructed otherwise. As they drive forward, a truck suddenly appears in front of them. The driver panics and tries to swerve, but the car still crashes into the side of the truck. The guards from the other car rush over to the wreckage, finding the vehicle in bad shape. The airbags in the front seats have deployed, and as one of the guards looks into the back seat, he is shocked to see Aijin hugging Jai, shielding her with his body. Jai, opening her eyes, is equally stunned. The guard can't believe how Aijin managed to protect her in a split second during such a tense situation. Feeling embarrassed, Jai quickly pulls away from Aijin just as the guard opens the door and asks if she is okay. The leader demands an explanation and the guards report that it looks like a drunk driving accident. This enrages the leader, but the guards explain that the truck driver appears unconscious and they are currently pulling him out of the vehicle. The leader orders them to call an ambulance, secure the driver, and ensure a thorough investigation, to which they all agree. Jai, still flustered, glances at Ai Jin. Meanwhile, the leader instructs the guards to repair an ambulance to take Jai to the hospital, suspecting she might be injured. However, Jai approaches Ai Jin first, asking if he is okay and insisting he come with her to check for injuries. Ai Jin, with a stern look, advises her to always wear a seatbelt, even in the back seat. Jai, touched by his concern, assures him that she will do so from now on. This gripping scene draws viewers into the chaotic and intense moments following the crash. Aijin's quick reflexes and protective nature are highlighted, revealing his deep sense of duty and care for Jai. As Dayon prepares lunch, Aijin enters the kitchen. Observing her busy at work, he courteously asks if she needs any help. Dayon smiles and replies that she is making the meal for Grandpa, adding that she will save some for him as well. Curious, Aijin asks how Grandpa will eat it since he is already at work. Dayan explains that she plans to take it to his workplace, just as she used to before, but hasn't had the chance to since Aijin's return. Feeling a surge of excitement, Aijin asks if he can accompany her. Dayan looks at him, surprised but his broad smile soon reassures her. As Grandpa supervises the workers, one of his colleagues remarks on his apparent happiness, joking that it looks like he's hit the jackpot. Grandpa, puzzled, asks what he means. The man replies that Grandpa seems exceptionally happy since returning from his vacation. Grandpa smiles and asks if it's really that obvious. The colleague then invites him to join for some snacks after their shift. Grandpa agrees, saying he'll come after handling some duties. The man agrees and advises him not to exhaust himself, as he can handle things later. While settling some recycling materials, Grandpa reflects on how excited he is about Aijin's return, thinking these are some of the best days of his life. Lost in thought, he hears someone asking a gangster-looking man to move his car as it's blocking traffic. The gangster gets angry, telling the person to shut up and that he'll move after throwing his garbage. He approaches the garbage can, but throws his cup on the ground instead. Grandpa, without saying a word, picks up the cup and throws it in the garbage. The gangster's girlfriend then asks him to throw away a garbage bag as well. The man angrily questions why she didn't give it to him earlier takes the bag, and throws it on the ground again. Grandpa collects the bag and disposes of it properly. Suddenly, Grandpa senses someone behind him. Turning around, he is delighted to see Dayun and Aijin. He asks what brings them here, and Dayun replies that she has brought him lunch. Grandpa smiles and says it wasn't necessary since he could have bought something nearby. Dayun approaches him, saying her cooking is better and that he prefers it. 
Noticing the recycling, she asks if he is sorting it. Grandpa explains that it's better to manage it before it piles up, as it can get out of hand quickly otherwise. Dayan rolls up her sleeves, insisting that she will help him. Grandpa protests, not wanting her to dirty her clothes, but Dayan remains firm, saying she can wash them later. She argues that if she helps, they'll finish the work faster and be able to enjoy lunch together, mentioning that she also made some of the braised lotus roots he loves. Edgen watches them with affection. People watch their affectionate family when Mr. Che emerges from the hospital, stating that there is no place better than home for a good night's sleep, as he hasn't been able to sleep at all. His assistant agrees, noting that no one can rest with nurses constantly coming in and out at night. Mr. Che then instructs him to find some healthy food. As they move forward, Mr. Che sees Ai Jin collecting recyclable material and is shocked to see him going through the trash. The assistant tells Mr. Cha recognizes the old man from their visit to Ai Jin's house and thought he looked familiar after seeing him frequently while visiting Mr. Cha. Mr. Che observes Dayan and makes some guesses, but then notices Ai Jin smiling, which makes him chuckle, thinking he didn't know Ai Jin could smile. In that moment, Ai Jin truly looks like an average teenager. The assistant asks if they should go over and say hello, but Mr. Chad disagrees, stating that people like them only spoil the fun and they should just focus on finding food. After cleaning the recyclable materials, Aijin and his family sit in the park to enjoy their lunch. They smile continuously, and after finishing, Aijin and Dayun say goodbye to their grandpa and leave. Several hours later at night, when grandpa finishes his job, he decides to pick up some snacks for the kids on his way. However, he notices a car parked in a no-parking zone. Approaching the vehicle, he tells the young man inside that he can't park there. The man angrily asks why, and Grandpa explains that parking in that spot blocks the entry and creates a hazard for children. He politely asks the man to move his car to the parking lot. The young man, growing more irate, retorts that he doesn't have to listen to an old man and insists he can park wherever he wants. Grandpa tries to reason with him, but the girl with the young man interrupts questioning if Grandpa is the guard and threatening that they could get him fired. Grandpa smiles and calmly explains that he is indeed paid by the residents of the building, which is why he is requesting they park elsewhere to avoid causing trouble. He also informs them that there is an open spot in the parking lot where they can park their car. The young man becomes even angrier, complaining that parking in the small lot could result in scratches on his expensive car and asking if Grandpa would pay for any damage. Grandpa looks at him in shock. The girl chuckles, doubting Grandpa's salary could cover the cost. Suddenly, a man grips the young man's neck from behind, angrily demanding why he disrespects his elders and shoving him lower. The young man shouts, asking who he is. The man, now facing him, demands how he dares to question him and orders him to speak up, but the young man is too frightened to utter a word. The man then pushes him again, telling him to take his car away and never show his face again, threatening that next time it will be worse. The young man and his girlfriend run away instantly. Mr. Cha then turns to Grandpa and smiles, asking if he is all right. Grandpa, still in shock, thanks him for his help. Realizing Grandpa doesn't recognize him, Mr. Cha explains that he often visits his friends here and met Grandpa once when he visited Ai Jin. Grandpa remembers him after this introduction. At the radio station, two guards stand outside. Mr. Cha's assistant comments that now he can face Ai Jin, as if he hadn't saved Grandpa from those disrespectful punks, things would have been worse. Mr. Cha chuckles, agreeing that he did the right thing. The assistant notes how disrespectful young people are these days. Suddenly, they sense someone walking in and are so shocked that they spill their drinks, their eyes widening as they see Ai Jin. Mr. Cha panics, wondering what he did wrong, and asks Ai Jin why he is storming in and giving them such a fearful look. Aijin takes out his phone and shows Mr. Cha a picture of his grandfather with the assistant. The assistant is shocked as Aijin asks if it was some kind of threat. Terrified, the assistant tries to explain that he just took a selfie, begging Aijin not to come any closer and to let him explain. Jai inquires about Aijin while reviewing the reports. He informs her that he will soon be concluding his training session with Team 3. She asks if he took him to a hospital for a checkup and what the doctor said. He responds that he has a few minor injuries, nothing serious. She advises him to ensure he asks how he is feeling because they can never predict what symptoms might develop after an accident. If he gets hurt and the media discovers that a minor is being put to work, they will face serious trouble. He assures her that he will inquire again. 
In the locker room, Seokju asks what is going on with him. Aijin asks what he means. Seokju reveals that he was holding back compared to their last session. Aijin explains that he was unfamiliar with how things were done, and there is no reason for him to seek trouble. He inquires about Seokju's situation, as he thought he was finished with security work. Seokju explains that he was never an official guard from the beginning. He only started because of his family, and since he grew up with Yona, he just did it because he was not bad at it. It became clear when he let Yona get kidnapped under his watch. He prevented a similar situation overseas, thought he could handle it alone, and let it get to his head. He asks where Aijin received his training because he looked like a professional dealing with those kidnappers. Aijin reveals that he learned on the streets where he used to live. They slide the door open and Yona is waiting for them. She asks if he is not going to try field duty today. He is confused and while blushing she tells him to be her bodyguard and assures him that he won't even need to change clothes because she doesn't do work like Jai. They are stunned and the scene shifts to a convenience store. She mentions that she missed the cup noodles and kimbap while she was in the US. Ajin stares at the kimbap and has flashbacks. She asks Ajin if he won't get anything else. Ajin replies that he shouldn't be eating if he is there to protect her. Seokju steps in and explains that it's fine because Team 3 is escorting her, and their job is to blend in as her friends and protect her from close by. She tells him to start eating, and Seokju understands because she chose the store near his house, knowing he would probably decline if she took him somewhere nice for dinner. Yona mentions that she heard he got into a car accident and asks if he is alright. He replies affirmatively while unwrapping the kimbap. She asks if Jai didn't give him a hard time because she is demanding and harsh. He replies that it was fine and Yona comments that it's unlike her as she smiles even when she is insulting someone. Seopchu snickers that she is also not her usual self. He looks at her and the scene shifts to the past when Aijin saved her father. Her father tells Aijin to go without him because he needs to live. He doesn't have much time left and won't be able to live long even if he is saved, and Aijin doesn't have to feel guilty about leaving him. He thanks Aijin and says that he is alone, indicating that others refused to help him or maybe needed more time. He is saddened because he won't be able to see his daughter's face one last time as he was returning home after completing this final project. Aijin tells him to get up if he is sad because people healthier than him die every day in this land, but he will not die today. He tells him to stand up and go see his daughter. Back to the present, Aijin asks if they can talk alone for a moment. She is taken aback, and Seokju stands up and leaves them. She asks what he wanted to talk about. He mentions the name Ingbek Sin, and she is stunned because it is her father's name. She asks what he wants to say. He inquires about her father's character. She reveals that her father was always busy and worked a lot overseas. They weren't very close because they barely saw each other. He got sick, and doctors told him that he didn't have much time left. But he wouldn't stop working and fell ill overseas. She couldn't understand why he chose to spend his last days working instead of with his loved ones. She was on her way to see him, but he had passed away by the time she arrived. He worked himself to death without seeing his daughter for the last time, and she confesses that she hates him for that. She doesn't know why Aijin is asking about her father, and she wouldn't have shared this if he hadn't saved her. Back to the past, Inguk asks if Aijin also thinks what they are doing is pointless. He just wanted to help the children of this place because he is also a parent and wanted to do something because it's the only way he can look his daughter in the eyes. He admits he hasn't been a good father to her and, if he had realized it sooner, he would have spent more time with her. He believes that family is the most important thing in the world. Returning to the present, Aijin tells Yona that she was the reason her father worked until the end. She is stunned, and he reveals that he is there to deliver the final request of his client. Aijin continues, explaining that her father wanted to see her one last time before he died and regrets that he couldn't make it happen. These were the words her father asked him to deliver. Yona is shocked, and the scene shifts to the past again. Aijin tells her father that they are near and he should go and tell her himself. Inga insists that he is making an official request, and that Aijin must find his daughter and deliver the message. Even if Ingbuk survives and sees her, it must still be Ijin who conveys it. Yona asks if Aijin met her father before he died, and Aijin says that's all he can disclose and stands up. She cannot believe that her father expressed those words for her and begins to cry. Aijin didn't understand it back then, but now he comprehends the meaning behind this request. Ingbuk wasn't doing it for himself, he made this request to get Aijin away from the battlefield. 
he was only trying to help him. The scene shifts to Aijin's home and the doorbell rings. He opens the door and is stunned to see Major Kang. His grandpa says that it's nice to meet him in person after only talking on the phone. He apologizes for not coming sooner to say hello, explaining that he came back to Korea with Aijin but wanted to give him time to reunite with his family. His grandpa says he had no idea and was just eager to thank him in person. He expresses how surprised he was to learn of everything Major Kang did for Aijin, thinking he was just an embassy employee and not the person who brought Aijin home. He reveals that they wouldn't have managed to come back without Major Kang's help, describing it as being brought back from hell. His grandpa reminds Aijin that he would have never found his way back home without their help and thanks Major Kang, bowing deeply. Aijin and Dayeon look at him, and Major Kang tells them there is no need for such formality. Grandpa assumes Major Kang must be a military major and questions how he met Aijin. Major Kang makes an excuse, saying Aijin was their guide overseas and got them out of a tough situation. They are stunned as he continues, explaining they wouldn't be alive without Aijin. Grandpa insists Major Kang stay for lunch because it's almost time. Major Kang thanks them for their generosity and talks with Dayeon, telling her that if she is Aijin's sister, then she is also his sister saying she now has two brothers to rely on. Dayeon tries to be polite, and Major Kang attempts to be casual and friendly. They serve the food and Major Kang quickly eats. Grandpa tells him there's no need to rush. Major Kang explains that he cannot remember the last time he had a meal this good. Grandpa gets worried and asks if his mother is no longer alive. Major Kang explains that she is a terrible cook, and he and his father prefer to eat out to spare themselves the discomfort of her cooking, despite often failing to convince her they enjoy it. Tears fall from his eyes as he reveals that the mess hall was the best thing about the military. Ajin quietly eats his food. The scene shifts to a convenience store where Major Kang is glad to see Ajin doing well, mentioning that all the boys send their best wishes. Ajin asks why he came. Major Kang explains he came because he was free and wanted to see Ajin. He mentions that Ajin's grandpa and sister are nice people. Standing, he says he needs to leave now. Ajin questions him, and Major Kang reveals he is late and needs to meet his fiance. Ajin is stunned that he is engaged. Major Kang, noticing Ajin's surprise, gets annoyed and asks why he looks so shocked, explaining that their parents arranged it and it might be for the best since he is very busy and has no time for dating. As he takes his leave, Major Kang suddenly stops and asks Ajin if he has found the answer to something they discussed before. The scene shifts to the past where Aijin asks Kang about family, and Kang is confused. Back in the present, Aijin replies that he doesn't totally understand it yet, but he thinks he is getting there. Major Kang is glad and leaves. The scene transitions to a building where Jai apologizes for calling Major Kang at the last minute because she didn't have time to meet him elsewhere. Major Kang replies that it's not a big deal since he was the one who suddenly called her, and he is happy she could spare the time. She mentions hearing that he was dispatched overseas and must be busy. Kang chuckles, saying he is nothing compared to her and is just scrambling around to look useful. She tells him not to be modest because she knows his busy schedule. Kang smiles and scratches his head. Jai says she never thought she would end up with a military person and that they wouldn't have met if their parents hadn't been eager to pair them up. She wonders how many times they have seen each other. Kang replies they have met 14 times and she reveals that it's far too little for being engaged for almost a year, suggesting they might be keeping themselves too busy with work. He giggles and Jai says she wants to ask a favor. She gives him a file on Aijin Yu, explaining that he is in Yona's class and that his documents were found to be fake. They tried to look into his records, but the authorities didn't allow them, so she wants Kane to take a look. Kang apologizes, seriously stating that he cannot help her with this. She understands and tells him not to get too serious about it. Kang becomes nervous and anxious, thinking about Aijin. The scene shifts to a few days later, and Aijin receives a call that Major Kang and his men were on a mission and have gone missing. Major Kang's team has been cornered. The enemy leader says they have driven them into a trap, and it is time to hunt them down. Aijin questions if the Major is in danger, and the chairman tells him that Kang and his men were ambushed by armed forces during a mission. They are being chased and forced to engage in combat, with the military trying to save Major Kang and his troops. He reveals this because Aijin has a close relationship with the Major. Aijin questions that if he is informed, it means Kang's chances of survival are slim. The chairman confirms this, informing him to brace himself and warns him not to make any rash decisions, 
urging him to leave it in the hands of the military. He reminds Ajin that things have changed for him and that he now has a family. Ajin understands, and the call ends. The scene shifts to the past, where Kang is excited because Ajin is really Korean. The men are surprised and ask if he got his memory back. He replies that he has only recovered a little bit. Ajin tries to remember, and Kang tells him not to force himself, offering him a drink. He tells Ajin that his real name is Ajin Yu. They play games together, and the scene changes to when they found his family. The men congratulate him, and Kang cannot believe that Ijin will go back to school when they return. The scene changes back to the present. His grandpa calls him to have dinner before it gets cold. Ijin comes out, and they tell him to take a seat. Grandpa says that the other guards were jealous because his grandkids came to eat lunch with him. Dayan finds it strange because other kids also visit their grandfathers. Grandpa reveals that their grandkids don't visit them. Dayan promises they will come visit him again with lunchboxes. Grandpa says he won't pressure them to come again. Ijin asks Grandpa how he would feel about helping someone who once helped him. Grandpa thinks and answers that there is no simple way to answer it. It depends on what kind of help he received and how he might be able to help them back. He reveals one thing. The one who helped him first had a lot to lose because they helped him without considering what they would get in return. He continues, explaining that there will be a time when he needs to repay someone for their kindness, and if it's not possible, he should try his best to return the favor. Grandpa asks if he is rambling too much because he is not good with words. Aijin reassures him, saying it's not a problem, and that he is glad to have met him again. Grandpa thanks Aijin, saying hearing that means a lot to him. He turns to Dayan and tells her he is glad to meet her again. She gets embarrassed and lowers her head. Ijin calls back the chairman and tells him that he will go to help, asking them to make arrangements for him. The scene shifts to Major Kang and his crew, who are tired from fighting and getting ready to rest. He orders his soldier to scan the area while others determine how close the enemy is. One soldier tells Major Kang that their men are in bad condition and Wangsik has lost a lot of blood. Kang says they need to reach the next checkpoint to wait for rescue to arrive, wondering if they can survive until then because they have almost run out of food and supplies. The enemy leader learns that they are close to giving up and is amazed they lasted this long, noting they would have suffered greater losses if not for having to save the civilians and being defeated by their familiarity with the terrain. Suddenly, he feels pain in his eyes and experiences flashbacks of Aijin slashing him. Whenever he is about to forget, the pain doesn't let him. Aijin waits for the plane to arrive at the location, remembering the conversation from before. They told him that the region is Grayan, one of the areas he operated in as a mercenary. Major Kang and his troops were sent to save a group of researchers gathering data on the area's minerals. The mission was going well when they were suddenly ambushed by an unknown armed force. They have prepared the items Aijin requested, and both nations' militaries have agreed to assist in his secure passage to the region. The chairman asks Aijin if he is sure about this, and Aijin confirms he is. The alarm rings, and they will land in 60 seconds. There is blood in Aijin's eyes as he gets ready for the mission. The scene shifts to school. Aijin is not at school, and Siukchu asks why he didn't come. Yona tells him that Aijin also didn't check her messages. The scene transitions to Aijin. He looks at the bullets and the destroyed terrain. He sees that the Major has not escaped from the second foothold, and that they might have moved on to foothold number three. Major Kang and his men are busy fighting the enemy. He notices an enemy holding an RPG, quickly shoots him, and the rocket blasts and kills the enemies. Kang asks for a report, and a soldier tells him that no one has been injured, but they are low on ammunition and might not have enough for another attack. Kang asks about how far the next checkpoint is, and the soldier reveals that it is 7.5 kilometers in a southwest direction. Kang asks about the time to reach it, and the soldier estimates it will take 3 hours and 20 minutes. Kang is annoyed because they need to walk three hours on foot with injured men and civilians through a jungle. His soldier explains that the enemy is repeating ambush and retreat tactics instead of a full-on attack. Kang now understands that they are trying to wear them down from the beginning and are willing to sacrifice their men to achieve this goal. The enemy soldiers don't fight like they are skilled but are deployed strategically by someone who is an expert. Their attacks were random at first, but he noticed their pattern after a few attacks forcing them to move to the first foothold, then to the second foothold, and the same happened again. They continue to chase them because they know their route better. Now the only thing they can do is reach foothold 3 and defend it until help arrives. Kang resolves to send his men back no matter what it takes. 
The enemy team reports the situation to their leader. It is going as he expected, but suddenly a guy bursts in angrily, asking how many of his men have to die like this and why he won't let them charge at full force instead of sacrificing them for retreat. The eye patch guy stands up and tells him in a cold tone that they are up against a highly trained specialized force, and charging at them without a strategy would kill his troops, leaving him with no men to fight and no territory. He assumes that none of this matters to him and finishes him off. He steps outside and sees the other men his soldiers have captured. He orders them to be killed and to go after the main enemy. On their way, a soldier tells Kang that they have covered half a kilometer and will reach the stronghold in time. Kang orders them to slow down and stay on guard because the enemy is familiar with the area and the route they are using, and it is likely they know where they are headed. The eye patch guy reveals that he enjoys this part of the hunt when he fools his prey into thinking they had escaped. He is excited to see their devastated faces and orders his soldier to tell the troops that the enemy will arrive soon. Major Kang continues on the route and they see bodies of the enemies lying around. He doesn't understand what happened here. Back at the camp, they tell the leader that Alpha Unit was waiting to ambush, but they have lost contact. He is stunned and explains that he has tried to contact them, but no one replies. He asks about Delta Unit and learns it is two clicks behind the enemy and closing in. He takes out the radio and contacts Delta. He asks for the situation and they report that they have been ambushed. He asks who they are fighting and they say they don't know. Suddenly, the connection cuts off and he grits his teeth, getting mad because they were the ones being hunted. Ijin is swiftly taking the enemies one by one and continues to move forward.